Test, test. meeting of the Anderson Township Board of Zoning Appeals is hereby called to order. This board was established pursuant to section 519.13 of the Ohio Revised Code by the Anderson Township Trustees to provide administrative relief to any person or entity adversely affected by the Anderson Township Zoning Resolution. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Cyan? Here. Mr. Haber? Here. Mr. Halpin? Present. Mr. Sheckles? Present. Mr. Nye? Here. Thank you for coming to this meeting of the Anderson Township Board of Zoning Appeals. Please be aware that this meeting is audio and videotaped and may be carried live on television. First, I'll outline our procedures. A summary of the appeal is presented by the staff, then the appellant will present its case. The board members may then ask questions of the appellant. After that, all persons supporting the appeal will be permitted to testify one at a time after being recognized by the chairman. When those persons supporting the appeal are finished, those opposed to the appeal will then be permitted to testify and or ask questions of the board after being recognized by the chairman. All persons wishing to testify, whether for or against appeal, may an appeal may only do so after being sworn in. When testifying, each person must come forward to the podium after being recognized, speak into the microphone, and state their name and address and any affiliation to the case. All persons testifying will be limited to four minutes unless a board member requests additional time. All testimony should be given to the board only. No comments or questions are to be directed to the appellant or anyone else in the audience, provided, however, that as we rediscovered last month, there is a right to cross-examine witnesses. <laughs> that needs to be in here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the board will only hear new non-repetitive evidence or questions. Should someone wish to show support of previous testimony, they may do so by following the testimony procedures and stating their support of previous testimony. Now. Will all persons who may give testimony this evening please stand, raise your right hand, and swear or affirm. Do you swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? All right. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Um, so there are no changes to tonight's agenda um, based on the updates sent out last week. Um, so tonight we'll, the board will be hearing uh, case 17. 20-2021 BZA, case 18-2021 BZA, and case 19-2021 BZA. Okay, so not 2021 BZA and not 21-2021. Correct. Okay, <laughs> everyone got that? <laughs> All right, uh, with that, uh, I'd ask for unanimous consent to approve the agenda. Any objection? Hearing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the October 7th minutes. Were there any changes to the minutes? Uh, there were no changes to the minutes of October 7th, 2021. Okay, I'd ask for unanimous consent to approve the minutes of the October 7th meeting. Any objection? Hearing none, the minutes are approved by unanimous consent. The next agenda item is a continuation of case 17-2021 BZA. This was a variance request to allow a single family residence with a rear yard setback of 21 feet 9 inches where 35 is required for the property at 2574 Little Dry Run Road. When we were here previously, there was also a request for a conditional use for an accessory apartment. I understand that has been withdrawn. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, who's going to present? Do you want to make a statement first? Oh, yes. yes. Thank okay. you. Um, last month at that meeting, uh, through a conflict of, of my schedule, I didn't wear, I had time wrong in my cell phone. I arrived approximately 40 minutes late. Amy, uh, who's one of the alternates, uh, sat on the board for the case in place of me. I stayed for the remainder of all the cases that were held that night. I reviewed the minutes of this case, and I have watched the video of this case. Any objection? So I think since Paul is an appointed member of the board, 
and he is familiar with the evidence, we're going to proceed with Paul to hear the continuation of his case. Does that sound right to everyone? Yes. Okay. All right, that is how we will proceed. So um, are we going to have staff represent the case as modified? Yeah, we'll, we'll go through it. I'll okay. try to keep it a little bit brief and just hit on some of the changes. Um, but we did want to present the findings and, every, and right. all the facts with the case. Um, so this is case 17-2021 BZA. Applicant is still Emily Hankey of Hankey Design. Uh, on behalf of Sarah and Brian Blazer, who are the property owners, address is 2574 Little Dry Run Road. Uh, again, this is a variance request to allow for a new single family residence with a rear yard setback of 21 feet 9 inches, where 35 feet is required. As Mr. Nye stated, the uh, application was revised from the October meeting where the request for a conditional use for an accessory apartment has been removed and is no longer part of case 17. Uh, so the applicant is proposing to construct a new single family residence on a vacant lot with a rear yard setback of 21 feet 9 inches. Uh, the lot would be accessed by, a, by the existing gravel drive, which is in a driveway easement on the west property line. Uh, the applicant is proposing to pave the portion of the driveway. Uh, there is currently a shed in the front yard area of the property, which would be demolished by the applicant prior to construction of the residence. Uh, they have, the applicant has also submitted a landscape plan for landscape improvements on the property. Um, and then uh, just this evening, the applicant has submitted a, an additional site plan. Um, however, it does not have a survey stamp on the site plan, um, but it just does show some, shows the building window and uh, shows what was on the previous site plan as well as submitted. Um, so I can hand that out after the uh, findings are presented. So at the October 7th, 2021 BZA meeting, the board continued case 17 until to tonight's meeting. Uh, the board requested that a landscape plan be submitted and encourage revisions to the proposed site plan based on public testimony heard at the October meeting. Uh, the applicant submitted a revised site plan which relocated the proposed exterior staircase to be inside the garage. The applicant also submitted a revised letter stating that they are no longer requesting a conditional use for an accessory apartment. Uh, this is a map of the property. Uh, again, there's, it's a vacant lot at this time. Uh, this is an aerial imagery showing the um, existing driveway and the existing vegetation that's on the property. Again, there's uh, some vegetation off on the eastern portion of the property, and that existing shed, as I referenced, is up on the northern portion of the property. Uh, the applicant's requesting a variance uh, for the rear yard setback along the southern portion of the property line. Uh, this is a topography map of the property showing the slope down from uh, west down to the east. Um, I know there was some discussion about the, um, the, the creek or drainage area along the property line. Um, so this shows the topography in the area. Uh, this is the proposed site plan. Again, they're requesting a variance for 21 feet 9 inches where 35 feet is required. Uh, the application does meet all other aspects of the Anderson Township Zoning Resolution. Uh, this is the proposed elevation that was resubmitted uh, after the October 7th meeting uh, by the applicant. Um, so as you can see, the, there is a loft above the um, existing, above the proposed garage. Um, but now the uh, proposed, the former exterior staircase has now been moved inside to the garage so that uh, the, the, pr the applicant or the property owner can access uh, the other livable areas of the house. Um, so therefore staff doesn't consider it an accessory apartment. Uh, these are the proposed floor plans for the home. And to my knowledge, nothing had changed from that, but I can, um, we can ask the applicant that. Uh, same, same with the upper level, nothing had changed other than the location of the stairway. Um, so within the stairway, you can go from uh, the garage up to the loft and into the other livable portions of the, prop of the proposed residence. The applicant did submit a revised landscape plan dated October 13, 2021. Um, so as you can see, there are, they are proposing additional trees and vegetation on the property, uh, specifically along the southern portion of the property line. 
um, to, to help screen that uh, the proposed rear yard setback variance there. Uh, this is an image looking towards the south from Little Dry Run Road. As you can see, there's an existing gravel driveway on the property. Again, the gravel drive, and this is looking uh, from, from the driveway up to the north. This is, excuse me, this is looking from uh, the, pr the property in question up to the residence to the north towards Little Dry Run Road. And this is looking at the existing shed on the property. Uh, it's kind of behind these, these trees here. Again, the applicant proposed to remove this structure uh, once the house is constructed. Um, and as you can see, the topography, it does slope down to the, uh, to the east. Uh, this is looking off to the east uh, on the property in question. As you can see, there is vege existing vegetation on the property and that slight slope down to the east. Uh, this is looking at the uh, residence to the south. Um, again, this is the area where the proposed 21-foot, uh, 9-inch rear yard setback is located. Uh, the property to the, uh, to the south there is approximately 295 feet away from the proposed residence. Um, so staff is of the opinion that the variance is not substantial due to the proposed landscape screening on the southern uh, property line between the proposed house and the residence to the south. Further, the location of the proposed house is approximately 295 feet from the adjacent residence to the south. The essential character of the neighborhood would not be altered and adjoining properties would not suffer a detriment as a result of the variance. The house is oriented towards the private drives so at the front and rear yard areas of the proposed house would function more as a side yard. The variance would not adversely affect the delivery of governmental services. Uh, the property owner's predicament can be feasibly obviated through some method other than a variance. The applicant could orient the residence to face Little Dry Run Road or reduce the size of the proposed residence to come into compliance with the zoning resolution. Staff is of the opinion that the spirit and intent behind the zoning requirement would be observed by granting the variance based on the vegetative screen to the south the distance to the residence to the south and the orientation of the house towards the private drive. Uh, we do still have um, two staff recommended conditions for this case. Uh, number one being a revised site plan shall be submitted uh, that is stamped by a registered surveyor. And number two, a solid landscape screen on the southern property line uh, of the lot shall be installed and maintained consistent with the landscape plan uh, that was submitted by the applicant and that's dated October 20th, 2021. Uh, these are the standards to be considered and I can answer any questions that the board has. Yeah, I have one. It, mm -hmm. is, uh, as part of a, a general building permit for residents, you have to provide a stamp drawing, and don't you? Th that's correct. So prior to township staff issuing a zoning certificate for a residence, a survey stamp site plan is required. Okay, will the appellant or the appellant's representative uh, please step forward, state your name and address, and present anything you need to present. Uh, Welcome Mr. back. Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. Um, I, I see in the minutes that the public hearing is closed. Oh. So I move that we reopen the public hearing. I'll second that. To include everything we just heard from PJ, I assume. Yes, yes. And incorporate all that. But all right. to open up the for the for, for the applicant. To Great. A motion and a second. Should we call the roll for that? Call the roll, please. Mr. Cyan? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Mr. Nye? Aye. Okay. Ms. Hankey, please. Hello, my name is Emily Hankey and I'm with Emily Hankey Design. My address is one one eight two four Forest Drive. Carmel, Indiana, 46033. So in regards to the changes um, from last month, a couple minor changes were made to the plan. So the first was that I took the garage wall facing the west property line and moved that four and a half feet closer to the private drive. I did not shift the footprint of the overall house. I just moved that wall closer to the private drive. That still gives us 25 feet 
five inches from the garage to the property line. So there's still a substantial amount of space from that garage wall to the property line. In doing so, um, what caused me to move that four and a half foot forward was to get to create space to move that stair into the garage. So the area it made most sense to move that stair into the garage, as the floor plans referenced, was between the garage wall and the house. That made it so that I did not have to modify the roof line, um, and I could work with the existing roof line and just get that stair to get enough height within um, the house. There are, or there will be maybe approximately two or three steps on the outside, just leading up to that door to make up for the grade, but it's not an entire exterior staircase. It would be nothing different than any, a couple steps into a house you would typically see. Um, so in moving that into the garage, that was really the only change to the plans as um, was mentioned in the briefing. There were no other changes to the floor plans um, from what you guys have saw last time. We did, as they mentioned, submit a landscape plan which showed the barrier around the perimeter of the property, called out the species, and in an email to the staff, I also clarified the heights of those um, trees, trees and shrubs along the south property line that were in question. So those are available. Um, so now instead of having, previously we were asking for about 18 foot because of that exterior stair, with that stair going away, our next closest bump out is now 21.9 off that property line. So not only did the stair move inside and get rid of that exterior staircase from the view, it also gave an extra three foot nine to the setback from the south property line. And just to make sure everybody is clear. Um, and then we had, in addition to the landscape plan, we also had a survey document done by a surveyor. He, I think, forgot to sign and stamp it, but we do have that from him. So we will get the, sign, the signature and stamp on that as well. Um, but we do have that available for anybody that wants to see that as well. That, and I believe that's it. Thank you guys. Uh, real quick, I think we have copies of that. I can maybe just run those down the line in case anyone has any questions about them. And we also, they also have it digitally if we need to pull it up on the screen for anyone as well. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Hanke? I do not. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who'd like to speak in favor? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm Brian Blazer, 8106 Megan's Lane. Um, I'm the, hopefully going to be the owner of the land, so I, I live off of Nagel Road right now. But one of the things we did, I um, also reached out on top of the landscaping plan, which we're totally open to put as much as the neighbors want, but we just made a general landscaping plan open to adding a lot more if they need. And I also talked to the neighbor on the south side, and I think we've got a good kind of um, talking with each other that he's okay with that, um, as long as we work with doing the landscaping plan. So I also, the, uh, the surveyor I tried to get three weeks ago, it's been about two and a half weeks, so he just got that at four o'clock today. I sent that over, so I apologize. I'll get that stamped as well, but that was just a quick printout that I made that I got at 4 o'clock today. So if you, when you guys need the stamp, if it gets approved, then I will uh, send that to you all. Any questions? Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in support of the appeal? Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name's Chris Watford. I live at 2570 Little Dry Run, the property right to the south. Um, Brian did reach out to me uh, about the landscape plan. I agree with it the way it looks, so I appreciate that. Um, I did have one question about the room over the garage for, for everyone. Is Since it's a single family home, can it be rented out separate from the home? Do you want to feel that? I think we, this is something we talked about last month, if you remember, and I think the opinion of staff is that it could be rented out separately without being a zoning violation, much like someone might rent out a room in their basement. Um, I think that I think that was the opinion of staff. Th that's correct. Yeah, so it, it could be rented out. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Or Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in support of the appeal in case seventeen? All right, hearing none, is there anyone like to be, who would like to be heard in opposition to the appellant in case 17? 
Anyone else would like to be heard on case 17, which is 2574, Little Dry Run? Okay, hearing none. Anything else from the board? Anyone, anyone, lose, anyone you want to <laughs> drag to the microphone to testify or anything? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, should we close the public hearing? Motion made. Second. A motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Cyan? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Mr. Nye? Aye. Okay, that concludes agenda item three. Agenda nine number four is discussion of case 17. Is there someone who'd like to start us? Sure. I noticed in watching the video last week that no one uh, said to the staff, great job at that <laughs> meeting. So here we are. Great job, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm in favor. I, I see. I have no objections. Anyone else? I'm going to uh, echo uh, that sentiment uh, and, and concur uh, and certainly appreciate the appellants reaching out to uh, the neighbors in order to come up to a satisfactory solution. Win-win all the way around. Totally in favor. Yeah. Anyone else? <coughs> all right, I'll just chime in to say that um, you know, looking at the factors we're supposed to consider, uh, the variance request is now 21 feet 9 inches, which is a, a lesser variance than uh, they were requesting before because they moved the staircase. I think that is not a substantial variance. I think it will not affect the character of the neighborhood. Those are obviously the two factors that tend to give the most um, weight, I think, with this board. Um, the other factors either are, are, are neutral kind of at best or worst, I guess. So. Um, I, I think on balance it certainly weighs in favor and I would also uh, vote in favor of granting it. I think um, obviously with staff's recommended conditions and uh, with our other standard conditions about construction dates and so on. Anything else? Would anyone care to make a motion? We're all working like this. What's that? <laughs> We're all working like this. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair, regarding uh, the continuation of case 17-2021-BZA. I move that we grant the variance request to allow a single family residence with the rear yard setback of 20 uh, 21 feet nine inches where 35 feet is required for the property located at 2574 Little Dry Run Road. Um, I am going to include staff's findings as well as staff's conditions and I just want to I've been filing my work already over here <laughs> revised site plan shall be submitted that is stamped and signed by a registered surveyor uh, and I believe that needs to be done prior to issuance of the Zoning certificate, correct? That's correct. Um, a solid landscape screen on the southern property line of the lot shall be installed and maintained consistent with the landscape plan that was submitted dated October 20, 2021, that it will be in substantial conformance with the documents dated October 20, 2021 and that construction will commence within a year and completed within two years. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. The secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Cyan? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Mr. Nye? Aye. <laughs> okay, that concludes agenda item number four. Four. Give me one second to shuffle some papers. All right. Uh, agenda item number five is consideration of case 18 2021 BZA, variance request to allow a four by six foot temporary sign to be posted on the property for up to 12 months, where only 48 days is permitted for the property located at uh, book 500, page 182, parcel 24, 
on Ayers Road. Will staff please present case 18? Yeah, so this report is going to be presented by our intern, Stefano Vicino. Stefano. All right, so uh, this is case number 18, 2021 BZA. Um, the applicant is going to be Dennis Moore and Soul LLP on behalf of uh, Forestville Realty General Partnership, which is the property owner. Uh, the location of the property is on uh, Ayers Road. Uh, it's book 100, page 22, parcel 24, and the zoning is AA residence. Um, the applicant is requesting a variance to allow a temporary sign um, located uh, on Ayers Road to be installed for a time period exceeding the maximum permitted 48 days a year per Article 5.5 E10 of the zoning resolution. Um, the proposed development, um, the applicant is, requi is requesting an extension for um, a four by six for sale sign. Uh, it's single sided and um, the, applicant is the applicant is proposing to sell approximately uh, 43 acres of the 117.8 acres of undeve undeveloped land. And the applicant is requesting uh, for the sign to be allowed for 12 months or until the property is sold. Um, there's not much history on the property. Um, on October 26, 2021, a zoning certificate for the sign um, was issued, and according to the zoning certificate, the sign was installed on October 14, 2021, um, and is to be removed on November 29, 2021. Uh, this is a property map showing the 117-acre um, property. Um, as you can see, the property does not have much frontage uh, except for a little bit on uh, Ayers Road and then um, about 510 feet on A Mile Road. Uh, this is an aerial map showing um, the vegetation on the property. As you can see, it's heavily wooded. Um, next slide. And then uh, this is a topography map. Um, Topography increases towards the center of the property and then um, decreases moving east um, towards a mile. Uh, this is a proposed sign submitted by the applicant. Um, that red uh, line uh, shows uh, the approximation of the location of the sign, um, which is at the end of um, the drive on Ayers Road. Uh, this is the proposed sign uh, that is currently up on the property. Um, shows. Um, the acreage for sale and um, the location. Uh, this picture was taken from the end of the drive on Ayers uh, Road. Um, this is a smaller sign that's been installed on the property uh, at the top of the driveway. And then um, you can see the larger sign towards the back of the property. Uh, this is a picture from the same location, but looking towards Ayers Road. Um, this is a picture of the property to the east, which is the nearest property, nearest residence to the property. Um, this picture is looking down the drive, looking towards the, towards the sign. And then there's a picture of the uh, 24 square feet sign uh, currently on the property. And then this is a picture from the sign uh, looking towards the nearest residence. And there's one more picture looking towards Ayers Road from the sign. As you can see, um, there is an increasing slope, making it less visible from the street. Uh, as of uh, for staff findings, um, staff is of the opinion that the variance would not be substantial. The large, pro the large property has minimal frontage and is not visible from the street, making it difficult to attract interest buyers. Um, the essential characters of the neighborhood would not be altered by the sign. The sign is located over 500 feet from Ayers Road and over 90 feet from the site of the, of the nearest residence. There is a decrease in grade from the driveway to the location to of the sign, making it less visible from Ayers Road. Um, the variance would not adversely affect the delivery of governmental services. Um, the property owner predicament can be feasibly obviated through some, other, some method other than a variance. Uh, without a variance, the sign would be taken down on November 29th, and the property owner could, in could then install a smaller sign um, up to eight square feet, which is permitted in residential areas without a time limit. Um, staff is of the opinion that the uh, sparing intent behind the zoning requirement would be observed, and substantial justice done by granting um, the variance based on the distance from Ayers Road and adjacent residences. Uh, further, the variance will, not will help facilitate the sale of undeveloped land uh, that is not visible from the street. Um, 
staff uh, recommendations um, should this variance be request be approved staff recommends uh, the following conditions uh, that the sign would be removed within 12 months or if the property is sold uh, whichever comes first uh, these are the standards to be considered for the variance and I would be happy to answer any questions does the board have any questions for staff Okay, thank you. Will the appellant or the appellant's representative please come present the case? Hello, my name is Betsy Emmert. I am with Dinsmore and Stoll LLP. My address is 255 East 5th Street, Suite 1900, Cincinnati, Ohio 45202. Thank you. Um, I'm here on behalf of Forestville Realty General Partnership to request a variance uh, for the temporary sign on Ayers Road. Um, we're asking that the variance be, be confirmed or granted uh, for Forestville Realty so that we may properly market the property. Um, we are otherwise in compliance with the requirements for temporary signs under the Anderson Township Zoning Resolution, um, short or save that the time that we are permitted to post the property. Um, as evidenced in the staff's report, this is a unique property. It's approximately 45 acres of a larger 117 acre property um, that uh, the applicant is seeking to sell. Um, and because of the limited frontage that we have, uh, we are working with a very small area that we can post the property. Comey and Shepard, our realtor, has worked with adjacent property owners to try to identify the best location for this sign, which um, is there off of Ayers Road, which is where we think is the only place we can post the property. Um, because that is where we are marketing um, the entrance for the proposed subdivision development for a prospective buyer to be located. Um, there are very few prospective buyers we anticipate for a property of this size who can develop the property for residential purposes. Um, so we are posed with some difficulties um, in marketing the property if we cannot post it with a sign. Um, that is the four by six sign presented in this report and um, request that we have 12 months or until we are able to sell the property, whichever comes first, um, which is a variance from the 48 days that the clock has started running on and we will have to otherwise remove um, on November 29th. Uh, are you asking for 12 months to start from the day the sign was erected or from the date the time currently expires? From the date the sign was erected on October 14th. Okay, so the same sign as they stay in place? Correct. Okay. Right. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak in support uh, of the appellant in case 18? Anyone here on 18, which is a sign on uh, for 40-ish, some 40 some acres on Ayers Road? Anyone? Hearing none, is there anyone like to speak in opposition to the appellant in case 18? Yes, sir. My name's John Jewell. I'm the closest property owner. It's uh, 7982 Ayers Road, Cincinnati, Ohio. I, not, I don't have any objection to the sign. I think they, and Williams have all the, you know, it's their property, they can sell it. My only concern is, <coughs> it, it, like the young lady mentioned, um, it, it's a larger property. It's nearly $3 million. I don't know how many people just are going to drive around to look for a sign. To I think there's other ways to market this than, than a sign for a $3 million property. My only concern is, uh, I have younger children, and the amount of traffic, because the picture that you guys had with the smaller sign, that's at the end of a private drive. So Ayers Road is actually about 350 feet down to, to actually get to the road. Um, the volume of traffic in, in both car and foot traffic has increased dramatically over the past month. Um, it became more concerning to us the other day my eight-year-old son, he just turned nine, was playing basketball, and somebody had walked through the yard and was asking questions about the property, which would just 
think that that's inappropriate. It's not their fault. It's not the Williams' fault. But that, that's our only concern. So I don't have any problems with the sign um, other than I would just ask that until, until it goes pending. I think once, a, once the property goes pending of this magnitude, somebody's serious, somebody's coming in with you know, nearly $3 million to develop land, I just ask if we could just take this sign down. Because right now it just it, it opens up, it encourages people. They, they come up, they drive up the private drive, they park their car, they get out, they see the small sign, and then they see the bigger sign back there. And, um, and technically that's private property to get back there. There's, a, there's a, an easement there. But, um, and then another concern is people hunt back there currently. And these people are walking around when, uh, you know, I, we know the hunters. So we see them going back and forth. And my wife mentioned that to somebody the other morning that was, you know, it's pretty dark out. Said, hey, you might not want to go walking around back there with people hunting. So it, it, it could get to a safety issue. But, but that's my only thing is if we could change the request that once the land goes pending, maybe the bigger sign comes down. Any questions from the board? Um, I, I have a question, I guess. Yes. Um, with respect to the concern about people, you know, kind of coming in, would would moving the sign to a different, you know, portion of that, moving it east or west, it no. change it at all? No. Is there anything? Uh, again, it's it's the, the property, like the picture showed, it's pretty it's pretty landlocked, you know, and and the frontage is not there's not a whole lot of frontage. A again, if you're coming up to that property, you will you had to have had some pre pre knowledge about it. You don't just drive around because again, even the small sign you can't see from Ayers Road where the drive you know where the, the public road is. So you have to drive up our private drive to even see the small sign. Um, and then and then once you get to the top and see that, then you, you know you saw the grade. It, it goes down pretty de de decent to where you can barely see the, the larger sign. Um, I can't imagine anywhere else to put that. Um, you can't really put it down at the bottom of the cul-de-sac, actually where the, the public road is. Um, it would be more, I think you would have more complaints from neighbors and, and you guys don't want that and they don't want to deal with that. So I, I don't have a problem with the location. Yeah, okay. And, but I just request that and once it goes pending, I don't even care if they take it off, just lay it down. And then that way, if something falls through, which deals can fall through, then you put it back up. Okay. Yeah. Any additional questions from the board? No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard uh, in opposition to the appellant in case 18? Hearing none, would the appellant like to rebut any of the testimony we heard? Just in response to the opposition, um, the smaller sign that is posted a little bit closer up to the road um, will still probably bring traffic back towards the property line. So I do understand your concern, especially with children, um, that if they're not used to having cars around and things like that, um, I'm from Hedge Park, so I'm used to <laughs> a lot of traffic. Um, but regardless, um, I do, you know, I do understand his concern that bringing the sign down is kind of an eyesore, the, at least the large one is, um, but I do not necessarily think that if the small sign remains, it will still attract cars um, driving down that road. So I don't necessarily think that bringing the larger sign down will reduce the traffic. Um, with that being said, if the board so chooses to uh, permit or request that the sign be taken down while it's pending, um, that I would request that the if for some reason the deal falls through and uh, the, the property is going to be marketed again, that the clock stops, so to speak, um, and we have 12 months, um, even if that time is not consecutive, um, to post the property um, until it's sold. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I do have one. Um, typically, signs like this are made out of plywood and dimensional lumber and. Mm -hmm. If this thing is going to be there for 12 months, I can see that it's going to um, decay. Uh, and is there any plan for maintenance of it, that it would be regularly painted or, or something? I, I see these up all the time, and they look like they're about ready to fall over and right. die. That's a great point. Um, I'm certain that our realtors, we have two working on this deal um, who are out and local, will be keeping tabs on the
the sign. Our hope is that the sign will not be up for 12 months and that we'll be able to bring it down sooner before the sign decays or um, loses its luster. Um, but we'll certainly um, agree as part of the variance request to maintain the sign for the time that it is posted on the property. Do we have a question? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I know the answer. It, this is also advertised on the MLS and other channels for that, free. That is correct. Thank you. Okay, yeah. nothing else? Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think we've heard all the testimony. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, please call the roll. Mr. Cyan? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Mr. Nye? Aye. All right, who'd like to start us off with discussion on case 18? <laughs> Anyone? I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I don't have an issue either. I, I'm willing to go with the condition. Uh, you know, I understand the neighbor's concern, but the, when I drove up there, I didn't even know the big sign was back there. I picked up the real estate sign, the small one, from down the intersection and drove up there. And even when I was there, I couldn't, is that a sign back there? So I, uh, that's not, marketing is your business, not mine, and we don't have a concern with that, but just, I don't know that the value is there <laughs> for the big sign. Yeah. Anyone else have thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm, Probably the one concern I have is if it goes pending and the sign is laid down and um, uh, uh, as I guess rebutted here that if that deal should go through then um, the sign goes back up and there's another 12 month period that I'm, 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 I'm concerned about that because it could go on forever or I don't think I that's don't what they're proposing. That's what you I think they're proposing. If, if two months the si they get an offer, it's pending, she takes the sign down, she and it, then it goes south, okay, she's got 10 months left on the sign. Oh, yeah. I, I think that's what, that's, that, yeah, that, is that what you're, yeah. yeah. That's what I understood the proposal to be. Good. I, I, I will say that for, for its worth, I think probably we shouldn't put staff in the position of having to force right. when things are pending and let's just say 12 months. Right. If it falls through, they can come back and ask for additional time and-, and That was my point, but was to not put staff in that position. Right, so I think a, you know, a, a date certain by which the time has to, the sign has to come down is better for enforcement okay. purposes. And if we get into that position, I'm sure they'll be back with another excellent application and I right. think they'll probably get a fair hearing on it. So you're saying just 12 months with no- 12 months or time. sale. Yeah, take it down yeah. at that point. That's that was what I that's what I would suggest. Right. Um, do do we want to require the sign to come down when it is pending, and then it can go back up if it falls through, but still got to come down by October fourteenth, twenty twenty two, or whatever it is. I forget. Okay. October twenty whatever. Staff over there pondering. So is that something staff would want to? Yeah. Is that as much of an enforcement headache for you? Yes. I mean, it'd just be up to the property owner to, to bring it down. I, it, we have no way other than the property owner letting us know that the sale is pending to enforce something like that. So right. Mr. Nye yeah. was correct in saying that. We, so would, um, we would be relying on the, uh, the goodwill of the owner mm -hmm. to say to us, we have a pending offer, we're right. gonna take our sign down. So from an enforcement standpoint, it would make more sense to have a time frame on it as opposed to sign needs to be up, sign needs to be down. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, right. if the board wants to grant a variance, they, they can do that. But. Okay, so I think that said, while I appreciate the concern about pending, I think probably the simplest thing for us to do is to, I, I would be in favor of granting a variance for, move it up until it's sold, or October 14th of next year, whichever is first. And if they want to take it down while it's pending to be a good neighbor, they may do that. But I don't want to, I don't want to get into a fight about whether, when it's pending and when it's not pending, that sort of thing. That gets a little extraneous to uh, zoning variance review. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where I come down on it. Yeah. I agree with your thought on that. Okay. So any additional discussion necessary? Okay, I'm getting a sense of the board that it's to grant the uh, variance in case 18, but 
since I am the chair, as we know, I'm not supposed to be making the motion. <laughs> so does anyone like to make a motion? All right. No, I'll yeah. Well, all right. I'll be up to it. It's sort of like trying Hi, to Paul. be the point guard for the Bulls after Jordan leaves. <laughs> you know? Okay. With regard to case number 18-2021-BZA, uh, the, uh, the uh, motion for the variance is approved uh, with the acknowledgement that once the property is sold, that the sign must come down. I would add that the sign be placed in accordance with the documents submitted October 14th that indicate it's going to be on the earth globe and it's the whole spot. Right. In the in the spot is indicated in the in the case number. Okay. And I can I also add that it would be maintained in good condition. Maintained in good condition. I think I agree with that too. All right, we've got a motion. Is there a I'll second? second? All right, will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Cyan? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Mr. Nye? Aye. All right, that concludes agenda item number five. I'm sorry, agenda item number six. Give me one second. All right. Um, You'll be able to pick up a zoning certificate probably tomorrow after we sign these resolutions. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you a call when it's ready. You're welcome to stick around, but not required to. All right, next item is um, item number seven, which is consideration of case 19-2021 BZA, request for a conditional use and a variance to allow a storage and distribution facility and an eight foot high chain link fence uh, for the, the Broadwell Road property. Um, before we have staff present the case, I think Mr. Muto is over here. I know you came in late uh, with the gentleman sitting next to you. Um, neither of you were sworn. If either of you gonna, are you going to offer testimony, will you please stand and be sworn now so I don't have to do it later in the middle of the case? Go ahead. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God? Thank you. Okay, so will staff please present case 19. Thank you, Mr. Nye. Uh, this is case 19-2021 BZA. The applicant is Tony Muto on behalf of Mount... Uh, Carmel Farms LLC property owner. Uh, this property is located at the corner of Broadwell Road and Mount Carmel Road. Uh, existing zoning on the property is ID Industrial Development. Uh, the request before you this evening is a conditional use and variance request to allow a storage and distribution facility for the storage of trailers and an eight foot high chain link fence where an eight foot high solid screen is required and that is per article 3.16 C4 Article 3.16 K2 of the Zoning Resolution. Uh, the applicant is op operating a storage and distribution facility by storing trailers on the property. The area of the trailer storage is approximately 117,000 square feet and is enclosed by an 8 foot high chain link fence where an 8 foot high solid screen is required. The storage area is accessed by two gravel driveways on Broadwell Road. Um, according to the applicant, the trailers are brought over from the Fast Track It or Bid FTA property located at 8485 Broadwell Road, and then they are stored on the property in question. The property owner purchased the property in 2003. In 2015, the property owner leased a portion of the property to Duke Energy to perform utility work in the area. In March 2021, staff received a complaint regarding a neighboring property owned by Evans Landscaping. Uh, during the inspection of the neighboring property, township staff noticed that trailers were being stored on the property in question. On June 1, 2021, staff notified the property owner of the violation as there is no zoning certificate on file for the storage of, of the trailers. On July 14, 2021, the property owner notified township staff that they will prepare a conditional use and variance request to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, this is a map showing the property um, again, it has frontage on both Broadwell Road and, and two places here, and then all along Mount Carmel Road uh, here on the eastern portion of the property. Uh, here is an aerial imagery showing uh, the existing property. Uh, the gray area here is the approximate location of the, uh, of the storage and distribution facility uh, where the uh, trailers are being stored at this time. You can kind of see here there's an existing gravel driveway. There's two existing gravel driveways, one located here 
and one located uh, over on the eastern portion of the property. Uh, there are residences located across the street on Broadwell Road and then an existing office use located uh, just to the south of the property. Uh, the property to the west is a uh, Senko, so an, uh, another industrial use here in this area. Uh, this is a topography map. Uh, the topography is relatively flat on this on the property in question. Uh, here's the proposed site plan uh, submitted by the applicant. Again, this is Exhibit H in your packet. Uh, so here's the area of the of the gravel parking the gravel storage area of the trailers. Um, it does show the eight foot high chain link fence around the property, around the storage area, excuse me, um, and then the existing gravel drive uh, along um, off of Broadwell Road. Uh, this is an image uh, showing the property in question. So this is looking towards the east uh, at the intersection of Mount Carmel Road and Broadwell Road. Uh, you can see the existing gravel driveway and uh, the existing agriculture um, on the property as well. Uh, this is looking from Broadwell Road up to the north towards the storage and distribution facility. You can see there are existing trees in the area. Um, you can kind of see the trail, the existing storage of trailers back um, in the background of this picture up towards the north. Uh, this is looking from the west uh, along Broadwell Road um, at the existing residences and towards both Senko and the existing office building located in the area. Again, this is looking from Broadwell Road to the north. Um, you can see the, the storage, of storage area uh, back on the northern portion of the property. Uh, this is looking from, uh, this is looking towards the south from the existing storage area uh, towards uh, Broadwell Road. Uh, this is an image showing the uh, storage area of the trailers. Um, again, it's accessed uh, from, two pri from two gravel driveways off of Broadwell Road. Again, looking towards uh, the, the storage area for the trailers. Uh, another image showing uh, the trailers and then the eight foot tall chain link fence around the storage area. Um, kind of a clearer image on a nicer day from uh, from looking at Broadwell Road over towards the storage area. You can see these, this white in the background is the, the trailers themselves. Uh, this is looking from Broadwell Road over towards the east, uh, approximately uh, almost on the property, uh, directly to the west of the property in question. So as you can see, the existing chain link fence does not provide any screening of the trailers uh, where an eight foot high solid screen is required. Uh, moving into the, con sorry, yeah. Oh, you're okay, okay, I see you, you do your thing. I think it's just chain link fence at the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. You see the one up by the trailer. Yeah, there's another one that's closer okay. surrounding the storage area. Okay. Uh, conditional use findings, these are the general considerations. Uh, number one, spirit and intent. The proposed use and development may comply with the spirit and intent of the zoning resolution and with the ID industrial development district purposes. The existing storage and distribution facility is consistent with neighbor, neighboring uh, industrial properties to the north and west. However, the storage area is visible from the property to the west as the area is not properly screened with a fence or dense row of vegetation. Uh, no adverse effect. The storage and distribution facility may have an adverse effect upon adjacent property or the public health, safety, and general welfare of the public. The storage area is located more than 500 feet from Mount, from Mount Carmel Road and Broadwell Road. However, the area is not properly screened with a fence or vegetation, and dust may reach neighboring properties due to the two gravel driveway entrances off of Broadwell Road. Protection of public services. The storage and distribution facility respects natural, scenic, and historic features of significant public interest. In addition to trailer storage, the property is also used for agriculture. Consistent with adopted township plans, the conditional use is in accordance with the light industry uh, land use category of the township's comprehensive plan, as well as the Ancor area master plan, uh, which encourage smaller scale industrial uses such as warehouses, storage, 
limited manufacturing, research and development, transit terminals, and wholesaling activities in enclosed facilities without offensive emissions or nuisance. And these are the performance standards. Um, a few of them are not applicable. Uh, number one is, is not applicable. Uh, number two, emissions is, is not applicable as trailers are not regulated by the US or Ohio EPA. Uh, regulated substances, this property does not involve the use of any regulated substances. Uh, number four, uh, vibration and shock. Uh, the, the storage of trailers uh, would not result in vibration or shock. Number five, nuisances. The trailer storage area is located approximately 547 feet from Broadwell Road and 515 feet from Mount Carmel Road. However, the storage area is located 64 feet from the property of the west and 17 feet from the property of the south. Therefore, the location could create a nuisance visible from surrounding properties. In addition, the driveway accessing the storage area was constructed with gravel and could result in dust beyond the south boundary line of the property in question. Lastly, the application did not include any information about how long the trailers would be stored on the property, and staff does have concerns about the trailers becoming inoperable or deteriorating over time if not maintained or removed in a timely manner. Uh, landscaping and other requirements. Uh, the applicant is requesting a variance to allow for an 8-foot high chain link fence where at least an 8-foot high solid fence or vegetation is required. Uh, there is not an existing solid screen from the property of the west and the vegetation screening the trailers from the property of the south is not located on the property in question. Staff recommends the property owner install a solid vegetative screen around the existing storage area. Uh, number seven is not applicable. And this is moving into the variance request findings. Again, this is a request for an eight foot high chain link fence where an eight foot high solid screen is required. Uh, staff is of the opinion that the variance could be substantial. The trailer stored on the property are 13 feet five inches high. Therefore, by following the eight foot high solid screen requirement, approximately 59% of the trailer would not be visible from neighboring properties. Existing vegetation located on the southeast portion of the property does help screen the trailers from Broadwell Road. However, these trees um, are for agricultural purposes and may be removed at some point in the future. The essential character of the neighborhood could be altered and surrounding properties could suffer a substantial detriment as a result of the variance. The storage area is visible from the property to the west. However, the storage area is located more than 500 feet from Broadwell Road, Mount Carmel Road, and the residences to the south. The variance would not adversely affect the, the delivery of governmental services. The property owner's predicament can be feasibly obviated through some method other than a variance. The property owner could install an eight foot high privacy fence or dense roll of foliage to be in compliance with the zoning resolution. Staff is of the opinion that the spirit and intent behind the zoning requirement may not be observed by granting the variance. Based on the visibility from Broadwell Road and the property to the west, the lack of vegetation on the western portion of the property, and the ability of the property owner to feasibly obviate their predicament through some method other than a variance. Uh, staff does have three recommended conditions should the board approve the conditional use uh, number one, existing trees located on the property shall remain so long as the storage and distribution facility is in operation. Number two, a solid vegetative screen shall be installed around the existing storage area. And number three, the two gravel drive driveway entrances from Broadwell Road shall be paved in accordance with Article 5.3 of the Zoning Resolution. Uh, these are the variant standards to be considered. Um, and the applicant did ask me to provide the exhibits that were submitted onto the screen, so I can click those, click through those if the board would like. Please do. Yeah. So this is Exhibit D, Exhibit E, Exhibit. And, and if you oh, could, sorry. yeah, just go back to Exhibit D, make sure we know where we are here. I'm those sorry, are the trailers okay. back in the middle there. That's and correct. Yeah. Broadwell Road. That's right? correct. Yeah, and we had staff had a similar picture as well, so same same location. And the existing trees you're referring to that tree line. Side of the picture, is that what you're referring to? Um, so in staff's report, we were um, we were referencing all of the trees that were that were on the property as far as the recommended condition goes. Okay, go ahead. 
and then existing storage area. Now, on the stuff. existing storage area, your recommendation includes vegetative screening along there as well? Yeah, so per Article uh, 3.16 of the zoning resolution, um, a either a dense row of uh, vegetative screen is required, at least eight feet in height, or a, a solid fence can be provided that's at least eight feet in height. Or, or is it and or? Or. Uh, exhibit F. Exhibit G. And exhibit I taken from uh, Broadwell Road. Uh, this is the view from the driveway leading to the enclosure. Um, going off of Cages aerials, these these trees do appear to be located on, um, not on the property in question, uh, on the property to the south. So the, the in other words, the property line is at the edge of the driveway before the trees there to the left. Going off of Cages, that the Cages yeah. that looks to be the okay. yeah. So those trees are not on their property. So going off of a Cages aerial image, it doesn't appear that those trees are, are on the property. Again, another view from uh, Broadwell Road looking towards the north. A uh, view of the enclosure from uh, the corner of Broadwell Road and Mount Carmel Road. That was the last of the images submitted by uh, the applicant, and I can answer any questions that the board has. Board have any questions for staff? No. Uh, okay. Uh, will the appellant or the appellant's representative please step to the microphone, identify your name, state your address, and present your case. <coughs> first <laughs> excuse myself I'm losing my voice I have a bottle of uh, right here that's wet my whistle so if you can't hear me please let me know sure. uh, my name is Tony Muto M-U-T-O I, I represent the landowner Mount Carmel Farms um, you want my address too yes please yeah my address is uh, my, my business address is post office box 8493 Cincinnati, Ohio 45208. Good enough for you. Thank you. Okay. Please get myself organized here. Thanks for the opportunity this evening. First of all, let me say that the conditional use permit and the variance request here are related to commercial uses on a piece of property which is zoned industrial development ID uh, in an area called ANCOR, A-N-C-O-R, which has been designated by the township in its land use plan as an area for industrial development and commercial uses. And um, would you put up the site plan? which is uh, Exhibit H. There it is. Yeah, th th this is the site plan we submitted. And as I say, it's, it's zoned uh, industrial development ID, and it's, it's in an area, Ancor, which is all industrial development with the exception of a few residences on, Bro on Broadwell Road. And as you go down Broadwell Road, uh, there are a number of other industrial businesses, uh, including uh, the tenant in a building at 8485 Broadwell, a company called Fast Track, and they'll testify here tonight. Senco is to the west. To the west of Senco is a company called uh, B-Wave, which makes commercial cans. There's a company called Pavestone, which makes uh, pavers. So the whole area is industrial development. So the use being requested here for conditional use we believe is consistent and in the spirit of what this area is designed to do. What I'd like to do is make a few introductory comments and then call a witness uh, from the tenant on this property, have uh, him testify, and then I'd like to get back up here and uh, make a few more comments. Uh, 
First of all, the conditional use, uh, as Mr. Ginty pointed out, is for this area on Exhibit H, uh, which is about three acres on a 30-acre site. This 30-acre site is principally used for uh, what we call a tree nursery. It's a tree nursery for a company called Evans Landscaping. That's right in this area here. And then on the corner, uh, up and down Mount Carmel Road, that property is leased to uh, a farming operation which uh, grows corn and soybeans on it. So the three acres here is the only part that's being requested for a conditional use on the 30 acre site. The conditional use is for uh, enclosing trailers, uh, which my witness will testify to, uh, and the fence that is put around it was put there largely to deter theft. As you may know, this area uh, is uh, overridden, I, I could very easily say, with a lot of theft on every piece of property up and down the road. So to deter theft, uh, my client and other businesses up and down the road have tried various things to deter theft. And the fence, the chain link, link fence is there in large part to deter uh, theft of the property which is inside these trailers. Uh, as Mr. Ginty pointed out, it's an eight foot chain link, chain link fence. Uh, and I'll comment more on some of, his, some of his points regarding vegetation and some other items he talked about, including the gravel driveways. Uh, if you would, Exhibit L for a moment. This Exhibit L is taken from Broadwell Road looking southwest. And as you look southwest, I, I think you can say uh, without, uh, without reservation that the trailer area is barely visible. There already exists on this site significant foliage and trees which serves as a dense screening for the trailers on the site. So I'm going to stop here with my commentary and have my witness come up here and talk more about the specifics on why this area is needed by the tenant. And by the way, I'm here representing the owner of the property uh, which is required for requesting this board to approve a conditional use permit or a variance, but the use of this property is by our tenant Fast Track, which is under contract to lease this property uh, at a rental rate uh, each month, and they're responsible for maintaining the area uh, for their trailers. So I'd like to call up here Mr. Jeffrey Fry, who's the CFO of Fast Track. Before you do that, does, it, does the board have any questions for Mr. Muto, or do you want to reserve them for later if there are any? Reserve. Reserve for later. Okay. How, how do you want him to? Do you intend to question him, or do you just want him to present a narrative? I'm going to ask some questions. You want to present questions. Okay. Um, in the past, uh, I'm talking to the board here, um, we've asked everyone to who pr intends to present narrative testimony to simply present their testimony and then have questioning of witnesses at the end. Usually we've done that for cross-examination, though. Does anyone have an objection to Mr. Moodle presenting his witness as if it's a direct examination of a witness? I think it makes sense. No. Okay. It's your case. Present it however you'd like to present it. Okay. So uh, your name and address, sir? Jeremy Fry. I work at 8485 Broadwell, 45244. Okay. And it sounds like Mr. Moodle has some questions for you. Um, First, Mr. Hayes. We, we had some discussion earlier about proximity to the microphone uh, and oh. whatnot, such that if Mr. Muto is going to be asking questions, that that it can be heard on the. I want to make sure we get a good recording. Yeah, thank you. Is that okay? Thank you, Mr. Hayward. Thank you. Mr. Fry, would you please uh, state the name of your employer? Yeah, it's bidfta.com. And uh, d describe to the board. What business uh, the company is in? We are an online auction company. We uh, primarily market uh, reverse logistics products, return goods. Um, we sell, we buy, and uh, 
by trailer and then we sell it to the public, the B to C company. And uh, do, do, you lease, do you lease property from uh, uh, the owner of this, of this parcel? Yes, we, we lease the property in, in question here. And then do, we, do you, do we you also you lease the former Cinco building on the other side of the street. That's where our main uh, central processing center is. Okay, what, what is done in that large building across the street? Uh, we call it our central processing center. So we receive uh, approximately 120 trucks of product every week. Or, or, yeah, every week. And um, we have 21 locations, well now 22 locations from Rogers, Arkansas up to now Elyria, Ohio, where we uh, auction pickup center. So we bring everything into this location and process it, which is to say what we do is we it's all reverse, so it's all returns, like you buy something from Amazon and you return it. Okay, that's one of our biggest things that we we're selling. It's about 30% of what we sell is Amazon returns. And um, we take it, we bring it in, we grade it, we say what it is, we describe it, we put it up on the, the website, and we sell it via auction. So if you, I don't know if anyone's been a bidder, okay, um, be careful, it's very addictive. <laughs> you can get some really great deals Sometimes not so good, but you get preponderance of great deals that can be really addictive. So um, we're really a cog in the uh, reverse logistics industry. We, um, you know, these product, well, Amazon, especially nowadays, I mean, they're a front-facing company. They try to do the best for their customers. So they're creating a lot of returns now just by their policies. They need something to do with these returns. They don't restock them or resell them. So we're, we're actually part of that growing cog of that industry right there called the reverse logistics. Okay, and Mr. Fry, uh, when the trailers come in to your warehouse area, uh, are the trailers all unloaded into the warehouse for inventory purposes? No, not all of them. Um, some, I mean, it's a 350,000 square foot facility. It's a monster. Um, we got a lot of product in there, but sometimes there's not enough room inside the building. So. That's why we have the trailers. We, it's just excess inventory is what it is. Okay, are, are some trailers stored on the property where the warehouse is located? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What's the reason you are storing trailers on the property that we're discussing this evening? There's just so much product coming our way and uh, we just need the extra space to store it temporarily. Um, it's an industry that's just growing and growing and growing. There's just so much out there um, that uh, there's just not enough room in the building or in the back lot to s store everything that's okay. coming our way. So let's focus. Let's focus our attention then on, on the area where the trailers are stored. Uh, do the trailers go directly to the storage area, or do they come to the warehouse building first? No, they come to the central processing center first, or the warehouse building. Um, and, and if we have room there, we'll put them right. The idea is not to store stuff. The idea is to bring it through and process it auction it off and sell it and move it to the auction pickup centers and get it out. Okay. In an ideal world, we'd be, you know, just in time, it'd be in and out and gone. So if we have room there, it goes straight there. If we have some room in the back, it'll go on the back and, you know, the receiving people, you know, decide where we're, I mean, the operations people tell us if we have room, receiving people say where we're going to, we're going to put okay. it. Okay. How many trailers approximately are stored on the warehouse property? On the warehouse property? 80. Uh, warehouse property, where, where the big warehouse is. How many on, trailers are okay, stored so outside? Okay, so we've got the, the hill in the back, right? Sorry, I, I emailed it to me, so I remember the number. So uh, let me just call this up real quick. Right now we call up the hill. In the back, there's 157. Around the building, there are 80. And in this per top this property there's 94 so that's a total of 331 trailers okay so there's 94 in the storage area that we're speaking about this evening correct yeah uh, how many trailers let's say a week are sent from the warehouse parcel to the enclosure area across about the street? 20 back and forth about 20 a week yeah uh, are there some weeks when less than 20 are sent across the street yes are there some weeks when there's zero Weeks where there's there's probably no weeks when there's zero. there's certainly days when there's zero, but there's probably no week that there's not some back and forth. What's inside those trailers, sir? It's it's returned goods. It's mostly consumer products. Um, you know anything you buy from Amazon, and we we so we Amazon's funny because the way they classify things is based off their size. And I'm using Amazon 
as the example because everyone knows it. We all buy from Amazon and stuff. So it could be Target, it could be Lowe's, it could be Home Depot. It's all kinds of retailers is what it is. So, I mean, it could be anything from weed eaters to electronics to, you know, printers or uh, coffee makers and Keurigs and, I mean, mostly consumer goods. Are, are there any hazardous materials? No. Uh, any gasoline or propane? No. Uh, are all the goods basically hard goods, uh, as I'll call them? Yeah. Uh, are there any trucks stored on this enclosure area, or is it only trailers? It's only trailers. So uh, a, a truck will bring a trailer to the enclosed area, but the truck would then leave and go back across the street. Is that That's correct? Right. We call that the yard dog. Yard dog comes, okay. goes, gets them, brings them back. What's the average length of stay for a trailer in that enclosed area? It's 24 days. Is that is that an average or is that what is that's that? That's totally an average. It's that's really our you know our um, days on hand. So that it could be longer, it could be shorter. Uh, does does any maintenance or repair work take place on the trailers inside the fenced area? Well, sometimes you know trailers don't move all the time, so the brakes will kind of but, you know, when a car sits, you know, the brakes will get a little, you know, we have to send a maintenance guy over there to unlock the brakes every now and then. It's, it's a compressor is what it is. So, yeah, there's a little bit, but that's it, just on the brakes. Do, do, you view the use of this pro do you view the use of this property for storage as a temporary uh, or a permanent solution to your overflow? As an accountant, you know, and the CFO, I'd hoped it had been te temporary, but, you know, I'd really like to have no inventory at all and let it move through. Uh, but the industry is just growing. So, I mean, we want it to be temporary, but I, it's going to be a while, I think. We're going to be able to use this property for a long time. Yeah. How, how long has fa it's available. I'm sorry. How, how long has Fast Track leased the warehouse space? For what period of time? It's been about six years, I think. I'd have to look at my spread. I mean, it was, uh, bear with me, I started in 2015, and uh, they were in there before me. So, you know, it's been since at least 2014. Well, a portion of the building. We, okay, so we so started at one portion and took over most of the rest of the building back in um, 2018. And how long have you used this property uh, for the storage of trailers? It's only been a couple of years. Really, the trailer storage has really picked up over just the last two years. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you had to predict over the next, let's say, 12 months, would you say that the number of trailers would stay the same or diminish? Well, there's capacity issues, so we can't get much more. I think there's 94 in that side now, and I don't think we can get, you know, over 100 in there. So, I, we're just going to have to stay the same. I mean, we've actually moved some stuff off-site. We've got some other property in like Mount Orb, like some. Okay. Yeah. And how would you describe the general condition of the trailers on that property? They're generally good. I mean, we track which ones are roadworthy and which ones are not. You know, we'd like to. So our, the trucking company that does all of our trucking from the CPC to the different locations, it's Brothers Express. And they they use either their trailers or our trailers. So we've got a fleet of about 80 trailers that are roadworthy. And sometimes they have product in them. We don't want them to have product, but some of them are roadworthy and some of them, but they're all in good condition. Okay. We got a we got four maintenance guys that are on site. They do all kinds of things from you know go to the different locations and um, you know do hard work and but they also maintain the trailer fleet as well. Okay, and when you said that uh, in an average week about 20 trailers are moved, is that 20 trailers going to and coming back? That would be a round trip, yes. So uh, would it be fair to say that 10 trailers a week are moved from the warehouse area to the enclosed area, and then 10, and then 10 are taken out of the enclosed area and moved back across the street? So a total, a total of 10 round trips. Okay, yeah. Is that correct? No, I'd say 20 round trips is what it was. So, um, well, no, we said 20 trailers out to each side. Yeah, we would move 20 trailers there each week. So, okay, so, but so I, I, I want to right? be clear. How many trailers a week, on average, are moved from the warehouse site into the enclosed area on this property? Yeah. This is, you know, the accountant. I need my spreadsheet in front of me, not just standing here. <laughs> so, 20 a week, yeah. 20 a week. Yeah. I like good rough round numbers. It's okay. 20 a week. How, ma how many are moved 
uh, from the enclosed site back across the street to the warehouse area. So if we move 20 there, we'll move 20 back, right? So that's why I say 20 round trips. Okay, that's 20 round trips. Yeah. So uh, that's on average about four round trips a day. Sure. On yeah. average. We're only at five work. Right. Well, we were at six work days, but now we're at five. Okay, and, and you said that's that's the maximum number. Uh, during some weeks, it might be less than 20 round trips. Yeah. Okay, in some days, it could be zero round trips, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. I have nothing further. You guys have questions? Or? Does the board have any questions for Mr. Fry? Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Mr. Moody, you have some additional comments, is that right? I, I do. Okay, go ahead. I'll try to be brief. I know your night's been long already. So let me first address uh, the comments on the conditional use permit request. Uh, it's for uh, out, outside storage, and it's, it's our position that the, all of the criteria set forth by the zoning resolutions uh, have been met and satisfied. Uh, I, I know that Mr. Ginty uh, talked about two driveways going into the, uh, in, I, I call it the enclosure area. Uh, that's not true. The only driveway that's used for these trailers to go is the driveway. Uh, PC, if you put up an exhibit. Yeah. Exhibit, I think, K. Yeah, K. This, this is the driveway that borders on the other parcel that Mr. Ginty talked about. This is a view from Broadwell Road. And this is the only driveway that goes back to the enclosed area. And as you can see, you cannot even see the enclosed area. Uh, the road is impacted gravel. It's not just gravel that spray, it's impacted. And minimal dust or dirt is created as these trailers go over this road. Uh, this driveway is about 550 feet from Broadwell back to the entry area of the enclosed area, of the, the enclosure. Uh, Mr. Ginty also said that the area is, is not buffered by any dense foliage. Well, in fact, as you can see along the left-hand side, it is. And if you go back, Mr. Ginty, to Exhibit H, I beg your pardon. Sorry. H. Uh, there it is. Okay, this is the enclosure. This area here that Mr. Ginter referred to as the southern border, which I, I agree is the southern border, there is dense foliage, in fact, trees 15 to 20 feet high, and then shrubbery. He made the point in his report that the shrubbery does not exist on the property of the applicant, the zoning resolution does not require that. If you read section 316K2, it, doesn't, it does not say that the dense foliage must be on the property owner's site. It simply says dense foliage. I, I would invite you to take a look at 316K2 uh, in that regard. Uh, Mr. Ginty also talked about the need to put uh, dense foliage around the northern border, which is right there, and the eastern border. Uh, I would submit to the board that there's not a need for that because the, the rule under the zoning resolution is that if the storage area is visible from the adjoining property, then you need dense foliage. Well, as you can see, this property line goes all the way back to right here, and the adjoining property is owned by the same company, Mount Carmel Farms. So there's no need to do dense foliage here to shield that part of the enclosure from an adjoining landowner. The eastern portion here, uh, and if you would put up, please, Mr. Ginty, exhibit. Hey, before we move on, <coughs> what is exhibit H? 
What is it? What, what, it says new parking lot for Mount Carmel Farms. What exactly am I looking at? Are you proposing to pave this? What, what is this? What's the source of this document? This is what I would call a site plan uh, showing, showing the contours of the parcel we're speaking about. So hold on one second. Can you go to Exhibit K again real quick? This is the driveway that you just told us is the only driveway that they use for trailers. Correct. But the site plan doesn't depict this driveway. It predicts the other. It depicts the other driveway. I, I beg your pardon. The site plan, Exhibit H, that we just looked at, shows a shaded area for the storage area, and it shows a shaded area for a driveway that is not this driveway. Sorry to make you hop around. Uh, I, I, See how it curves out to the east there and then goes down. The the driveway that was in Exhibit K goes from that yellow square there correct. back to the corner of the storage area. I'm just trying to figure out which driveway are you using and why does Exhibit H depict in shaded or hatched uh, area the, the other driveway? I'm sorry. This is, this is an existing driveway that has been there prior to this driveway here. This driveway is used by the tree farm and by the agricultural site. And this driveway, which you saw in Exhibit K, is the one that hugs this property line and is the one used by the tenant to get trailers back to this area. Okay, so the rectangular storage area we can all see in the site plan, but the driveway area on this site plan is not the driveway that is used for the storage area, is that right? Th that's correct. Okay. That's correct, and it's an oversight on our part we should have shaded in this area as to show another driveway. So I appreciate your question. Thank you. Yeah, th th this, this is not the driveway used by Fast Track. The driveway they use is right here. That's what I thought. I just right wasn't here. sure. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate your correction on that. We, we, will, we will admit and we will submit to the board that uh, as a condition of the conditional use, the west part of the property is clearly not covered or screened by foliage and and we would agree that uh, if the board uh, approves this conditional conditional use permit that we should be expected and required to install uh, dense foliage eight feet high on the west border because this this adjoining property owner right here Senco can see it's visible there's no question about it uh, but this property owner here this is a separate parcel of property. This property owner cannot see this enclosed area because of dense foliage on this southern border. And again, the zoning resolution does not require that the foliage be on the applicant's property. It just says dense foliage. Okay, can I ask a question? Sure. That property owner decides to take all that foliage down. What happens? It's a great question. I appreciate the question. If, if, if it did, then I would expect the township to be pretty quick to tell us that we have to install dense foliage. But as long as it exists, it, it, it satisfies Section 316K2. So you would agree to that condition? We would agree to the condition uh, if the foliage was removed by the adjoining property owner. And by the same token, Mr. Ginty pointed out that some of the trees and what we call the tree nursery on this on this site could be removed we would expect a condition from the board that says if you take down some of the existing nursery trees you must replace them uh, if you uh, if you did go back to uh, exhibit k i'm sorry not k l What we're seeing here, I took this photograph, and I'm standing at the, Mr. Nye, I'm standing at the driveway that you were referring to earlier, and I took a photograph, and you, as you can see, I, th I think it's obvious that 
the foliage, and, and it clearly is foliage, it may not be foliage adjacent to the fence, but it's clearly foliage that is shielding or screening the enclosure from Broadwell Road. I, I'm standing on Broadwell Road with, a, with this photograph, and to the extent that these trees might be taken down by the nursery owner, the tree nursery owner, we would expect a condition that says you have to replace them. If you would go to exhibit uh, M, please. Uh, okay, L, M, yeah. Okay, this, for this photograph, I'm standing at the corner of Broadwell and Mount Carmel Road, and you can see even less. In fact, I don't think I can see the, uh, the trailers. Uh, perhaps it's that white area you see way in the distance, but there's adjoining property to the property in question, and uh, I, I, I'm confident that the shielding here satisfies Section 316 K, K2. So the, the, only, the only part of the enclosure that needs to be covered with eight foot dense foliage is the west portion facing the Seneca property. The, the staff report also recommends that both driveways be paved. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't believe that the middle, I'll call it the middle driveway, is even a relevant part of the discussion tonight because that's not used by the tenant. As far as the driveway they do use, we, we do not believe that paving is required because of the fact that the surface is what we call, uh, what, what my client calls, impacted gravel. It's tamped down very tight. What we would be willing to, uh, to do uh, in an effort to keep down whatever minimal dust may occur is that during the dry season, uh, we would water, water down that driveway. Uh, my client has a number of water trucks that are used on other job sites for that very purpose, to water down areas that may create dust during movement of equipment. And we believe that, and we're confident that, uh, if we observe that watering condition during the dry season, that the dust that might, might be kicked up would be minimized, probably eliminated. I'm sorry, Mr. Shekels. I'm, I'm drawing in the, the white that I see in the middle are the trailers, correct? It, it appears to me that they could be some of the trailers. But uh, what you're seeing here is perhaps two or three trailers. The, the enclosed area is a much, it's a three acre piece. And what you're seeing from this corner of Broadwell and Mark Carmel is uh, a very faint view of what appears to be a trailer or two. And the spirit and intent, I think, of the screening obligation or the screening requirement is to minimize visibility of open storage. And I would submit to the board that, that this tree farm minimizes, maybe even eliminates, uh, any obvious visibility to a driver or a walker. In fact, if you know the area, Broadwell Road is not a pedestrian roadway, it's vehicle traffic. So vehicle traffic would drive by here and I would submit to the board that uh, this, to the extent that there is visibility of trailers, this in no way, in my view, represents uh, a violation of the spirit or intent of the, of the zoning resolution with respect to screening of open storage areas. One more question, if I may. Sure. Uh, that's a landscape operation, correct? I'm sorry? That in the front is a landscape operation? The area here, yes. So those trees are going to be coming up and down all the time? I wouldn't say all the time, but uh, they, they would. Some trees get taken out. That's why I say uh, we, we think a reasonable condition that 
should be placed on this would, would be to the extent a tree comes out because we sold it to a, a consumer uh, of our landscaping business, we should, we should be obligated and expected to replace it with another tree. Uh, but, but yes, to answer, Mr. Jekyll, there is movement in and out uh, over the course of the year, not so much in the winter months, uh, but certainly in the spring and early, early summer. Thank you. So it's just a, in, in summary, uh, we, we believe that uh, we've presented material here that uh, justifies approval of a conditional use permit for the enclosed area and a variance for the uh, chain link fence. Uh, we believe that uh, except for the west side of the property, dense foliage already exists uh, around the other three sides uh, in full compliance with section 316K2. Uh, and we would expect uh, as part of the condition that, that the applicant uh, put in place the required eight foot dense foliage on the west side we do not believe that a pavement of the driveway is required, but we do believe that an obligation to water it on a, on a, on a periodic basis during the dry season should be expected of the applicant to keep any potential for dust kicking up uh, minimized. Uh, and we would say that uh, the foliage that exists on adjoining property should be counted as foliage that provides screening. The, re the resolution does not require that that foliage be on the applicant's property. Any additional questions for Mr. Rudolph? Um, I have actually have just a follow-up question for Mr. Fry, if I may. Um, since, since you're the one in charge of running the trailers in and out, is it right that you're only using that one driveway that's all the way on the westernmost property line? That's right. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in support of the appellant in case 19-2021 VZA? Anyone else like to be heard in support of the applicant in case 19? Okay, hearing none, is there anyone like to be heard in opposition to the appellant in case 19-2021? See a couple nods. Does anybody wanna start us off? Your name and address, please, ma'am. My name is Peggy Johnston. Um, I live at 8517 Broadwell Road across the street, three houses down from this driveway that they're, um, they've been using. Did I need to give you pictures before if I have pictures? If you have, do you have, uh, do you have one copy that we need to share? Do you have a... I'm sorry. Are these I didn't photos you took? Uh, yes. Yes, I actually took these um, last year um, in August and they were sent to the EPA and also to Anderson Township to show them the ongoing dust problems we have on Brywell Road. Um, I did get a letter back from the EPA. I ne heard nothing back from Anderson. And um, the EPA did contact the owner of the property. They were told and they did comply with watering down the drive for about a week or two, and then that stopped. That was August of last year. So um, these are just pictures that I had taken to send to the EPA and Anderson. Um, and this has been an ongoing problem on this location and other locations in the area. We have a dust and dirt problem. But the pictures you can see, these were not even the semi-trucks that uh, to, uh, park their trailers in the back. These were just trucks that use the facility. Um, I know it's a packed, he said it was a packed gravel, but you can see in a dirty, dry area um, in the summer, that, that's the, what we see from our front yard. Those, some of those were taken from my front yard. And um, this facility, or this enclosure, was built about three years ago for ARC to be using for when Duke put in poles and everything. It was supposed to be a temporary um, place for them to put their machinery, their equipment when they were putting up our new electric poles. Um, after that, it just seemed to become a storage place and it was added on and added on and added on. I think Mr. Um, 
cry from fast tracks that he's been using that for about three or four years or two years I'm not sure how long fast track has been using it but it was I thought it was supposed to be a temporary use and uh, it immediately became a uh, after arc left and immediately became a storage facility um, they do move their trailers back and forth and a lot of times it's in the evening um, I don't think it's one or two a day. It seems to be more than that. I did take some pictures yesterday um, from the same area, um, but I didn't have time to have those developed. Um, and the only people you'll hear any complaints about on this area is one or two homeowners and a couple of businesses because most of that valley is owned by one owner. Uh, so nothing is really said about it. This was zoned agricultural, and at one time it was all residential. We've lived in our home since 1959. My husband's family bought that home. There was cows and farms there when, we, when the family bought the house. It, this is all grown up around us. It's not our fault. But we can't open a window, a door. You have trucks from not just this facility all the time using Mount Carmel road um, we don't mind anybody doing uh, making money on a business I, that's good that he could use this facility but a paved road would be nice it would cut down on everything uh, especially the dust and we've talked about the theft in the neighborhood we've lived there for years we haven't had a theft it seems like ARC I think they put up a fence around that because they did have some expensive equipment back there. Uh, we don't have any theft in our neighborhood. I haven't seen a lot. Maybe you do have theft, but I don't see eight foot chain link fences around Cinco where he's storing his facility, storing his tractor trailers now. You can drive in and out of there anytime. And one thing I will say about that, I get very tired of leaving at 4.30 in the morning with tractor trailers running and running and running and running all night long, um, probably about 100 yards from my back door at the fast track at facility. And let's uh, see, you're talking about the agricultural. You see all the little trees that they have planted lately on your exhibit M, and you see some nice big trees. Those are taken down at Christmas time. You see nice little pine trees. When you have little trees put in, there goes your site. And he's not showing pictures behind here and to the right are cornfields. Those are about ready to be cut down. You will be able to see all of this facility from Mount Carmel Road once the corn where the agricultural is running right now is cut down. And uh, I can't think of anything else to say, but I hope you enjoyed the pictures. But uh, real quick, yeah. ab about those pictures, your home is across the, s so on if the site plan we saw the little kind of cutout in this property, right. no you don't need to. Yeah, if and you're that's Carlin or comp Carlin Company or something, C. A. Carlin. Something. Uh, Does yes. that sound right? Directly across the street from my house. Okay, and yes. Th that you're, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. You're yes. directly across the street from. Yes. Me. Okay, so I those pictures we we saw are from, were from your driveway. house, looking east on Broadway. Yes, and you can see how sharp that is as you're seeing that drive, how it comes out. The tractor trailers actually have to come out quite a ways. Now he did um, the owner of that property did give them permission to do a cutaway so they can see but when those trailers come out you have to come out into the road because it's a very sharp turn on that tree line so yeah those pictures were taken from my driveway okay. trying to so. make sure I knew where we were in space yeah Got I'm it. like two houses down west of the driveway okay so okay any questions from the board for Ms. Johnson okay well, let's get all the testimony in, and then, yes, you will get a, a chance to respond. Uh, is there anyone else who'd like to speak in opposition to the appellant in case 19? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is John Rutherford. Uh, I'm the owner of the 8500 Broadwell Road address, uh, which is the same address that they're using for this property, uh, which becomes a, a different issue, but one that's significant and I want to talk about. I appreciate you pulling up, you know, the exhibit H and seeing the difference of how this is migrated to there and where this is. 
Uh, my office building is adjacent to this property and this is right behind it. So when you're really looking at the office building and when you talk about there's no nuisances in, involved with this, uh, there are trucks every day. I know that they stated that there was a maximum of 20 trailers moved per week, and that is false. Um, there's trucks going in and out of that property all day long that's there, and I'm there Monday through Friday. My office looks directly at that driveway that's going back. The only thing that's dividing the driveway is the set of uh, honeysuckle hedges that's on our property that's there. And when those honeysuckle, when this winter comes and the leaves fall, everything is visible. So the property the, along the back of the uh, property, the, all the trees that are there, it's honeysuckle. And that does fall down and that is completely visible that's there. The movement in that lot and the amount of dust that's happening in the movement in the lot as well as the driveway coming up the side of the property is a significant amount of dust that is affecting our business. Our business is a consumer packaged goods grocery business. We are in the food business. So to keep the dust and stuff down that's there, it continues to be just a challenge with us. So the other piece um, is those trees, like she said, the trees that are over there to the right of my property, uh, being that it is a nursery, they used to have tall pines everywhere through there. Now they've sold a lot of those and they replaced them with the non-pines that you will see in Exhibit L. Um, and the other piece to that picture in Exhibit L is when you think about perspective and a visual, if you take a camera and you take a picture and you see far back in the picture it is those little, you know, you can see the white trailers there. And the gentleman here said that it was probably two or three trailers. Uh, if you look at the perspective and how that goes into there, that's a lot of trailers. There's a lot of trailers back there, and that part of it's there. But when the, the leaves and all the trees, that they replaced them with the little skinny trees, that is very visible that's there. My concern is that within our business, and when I bought the business in 2014, uh, Mr. Evans ended up taking the back of it and he did this at night. I didn't even know that he was doing this. So he came in and cut a bunch of my trees down, made a transition back there and went back to the driveway, built all this stuff back there. It didn't do it on Monday through Friday from eight to five. He did it in, in when we weren't there. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, we have all these great big, huge steel telephone poles back there. And he was using that as a facility to lease out for it. And then when they left, Fast Track quickly moved in and started this piece of it. And uh, it has been just you know, a mess since then. So we have had, it went from bad when the big poles were there to worse with constant traffic flow going back and forth into the facility. So that, that part of the nuisance, it's not a nuisance factor. It absolutely is a nuisance factor that's there. So that's, appreciate your time. All right. Does the board have any and questions? Have no, one more thing, please. Yeah. Uh, 8500 Broadwell Road, which is part of this case, that's the same address that was used in this case, is our address, and it's on the sign in the front of our building. So when I look at 8500 Broadwell Road that's there, and as you mentioned, it's CA is the name of our company, we're having drivers, truck drivers, come to our facility on a regular basis, weekly, coming in and asking, they, the, the gate will be blocked back there, and they're coming in saying, hey, we're supposed to pick up a trailer, and uh, we can't get in, can you let us into the gate? I said, that's not my facility, that's fast track, and they're like, well, look here, it says right here on the P or on the order, 8500 Broadwell Road is the address that they're using for them to come and pick these trailers up, and yet they can't get in, so they're coming and bothering our business and trying to get in there to make this thing happen. So that's even worse. And, and you know, I just, it's a constant nuisance. Sure, go ahead. Uh, your recommendations. My recommendation one is that they change the address so when the people come in that they are not coming to our facility. They don't use 8500 Broadwell Road for that facility. What would it be, what you think? Uh, post office. Oh, the post office needs to go in. Yeah. yeah, let somebody. I mean, I don't. I don't. I'm not the expert in addresses to say what that should be. It just. I wish it wasn't my address. So you know, we bought it to run that business. 
the other recommendation is if they're going to operate this back there they need to one i mean he's been doing it without the zoning he's been doing it a long time since 2015 he's been back there operating a facility um and business out of that facility back there and then uh the the dirt and the dust and the gravel my recommendation is that he paved both the driveway and paved the parking lot and put up the the fence that you cannot see around it because as you mentioned earlier what if the owner does take those bushes down the previous owner of this property is sitting back there and he did a great job maintaining all the the hedges around the property it looked nice i haven't been able to do that because right after i bought the property he i you can see right through it so i've had to let all this honeysuckle grow out and i've lost approximately 10 feet of the perimeter of my land all the way around there just so i could try to block some of it and you can still see it and the entire winter time it is it is completely visible so my recommendation would be to pave the entire facility put a fence up so we can't see it and use a different address please it's a different issue do trucks come into your property they do and we have a sign out front on a driveway saying no semi trucks because the weight of those semi trucks on my blacktop driveway can do damage and so they do come in plus the way my driveway comes in and it turns and goes this way they can't go in there and turn and turn around and they try so they go in there and the next thing you know that's like now what are they doing so now they're tying up my whole business driveway so they can figure out how to back out and get out of this thing without tearing up my and that's the other piece they've gotten into my yard put big ruts and divots in the property itself the yard and there's no retribution and nobody's coming over and fixing that mm -hmm. thank you <clears throat> is there anyone else who'd like to be heard in opposition to the appellant in case 19 yes sir Good evening, Jason Gordon, 4300 Mount Carmel Road. Um, I live just around the corner. Um, I've got just a couple of points to make here. Uh, as I said, they've been using it for trailers for about two years, but prior to that, it's been um, um, from, from the ARC company since about 2016. Um, the trailers are not just stored on that parcel of land. In fact, um, this is an Evans, Doug Evans parcel of land. Mount Carmel Farms is, is one of his many holding companies. Um, so uh, they're also storing trailers on the BRL Development Company, which is a, a parcel adjacent to the fast tracking facility. I believe that's the one that Mr. Price said, the hill in the back. Um, there's several hundred more trailers on another parcel. Uh, I don't know if they're permitted to be there or not. They're also storing uh, trailers on another parcel adjacent to that. Uh, when I have the parcel numbers here, if that would help. Yeah, do you want me to go to the aerial? Yeah, if you'd like, that'd be fine. I don't, I don't know if I zoomed out far enough, but it might give the board a reference. Yeah, I don't know that it's you're going to capture it in there, but the fast track at facility is that kind of diagonal looking one there. Uh, there's uh, just off to the um, southwest of that image, there's um, a dirt area that they're parking a number of trailers on that's on yet another parcel. Um, and I can give the uh, parcel number here to PJ. Do you want to just read it in? Yeah, I'll read it. Yeah, if you, yeah, oh. you want to read it into oh, the minutes, that'd be great. Uh, that is parcel number. Five zero 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 eight three zero 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 three. That's another Doug Evans facility. That's uh, under the name of BRL Development Company LLC. I'm sure Mr. Evans would like to be here this evening to defend himself, but he's spending time in Ashland Federal Correction uh, right now. Now the other parcel number is five zero 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 eight one zero zero three. That's the 8361 Broadwell Road facility. And I believe they're also doing some illegal open pit mining on that facility as well. Um, that the topography in the back of that facility has changed over time. And I don't know that that's permitted to be there as well. So we talked about uh, in the previous cases, the burden of putting the burden on staff to enforce this stuff. Um, if we're talking about putting trees in and out, uh, you know, you're gonna, you're not gonna trust Doug Evans, um, who's convicted of felony fraud, to make sure that the trees equal in and out. I mean, I wouldn't trust that guy. 
um, and it, certainly you don't want PJ out there counting trees every day. That doesn't really work. Um, and then uh, next burden of enforcement. So the land is an industrial piece of property, but they're enjoying a significant CAUV tax exemption on uh, the remainder of that property. So it's largely used for industrial purposes. And as they talked, uh, the corn is gonna come down here soon and next year it'll be soy. So you'll be able to see, you can see, we can see the trailers coming up here tonight from Mount Carmel Road uh, over the tops of the corn. So an eight foot high fence, in my opinion, isn't gonna cut it to block the semis out of that image. I mean, it's gonna need to be, you know, at least a 15 foot tall fence <laughs> so that you don't see that stuff. Um, you know, and in the, uh, in the first case with the property owner and the setback requirements, I mean, you're making that, that property owner was responsible to put um, dense foliage around to shield their property from, from the adjacent property. And here we've got, um, you know, the appellate saying, we'll use the foliage on somebody else's property to count for the foliage on our property. And I just don't think that that's right. And they've already set precedent that that's not correct, so. Um, you're doing a significant disservice to the homeowners. This is a nuisance. There's six homes that they drive past uh, to get from that lot over to the entrance of Fast Track. And while this is an industrial area, it's pretty quiet in the evenings. Um, but they're humping these trailers from that lot over to Fast Track at all hours of the day and night. Um, and I mean, while I don't live across the street there, that would be a significant nuisance to me if I did. Um, the gravel driveway, is there a setback requirement for that gravel driveway? I mean, it is right on the property line to that 8,500 property. Um, is, there a, is there a setback requirement for? for so uh, I can pull up our zoning resolution and get that answer for you. Yeah, so I mean, it, it would seem to me that if you're going to approve it, which I don't think you should, they should move the driveway away from the other um, adjoining par parcel there. Um, they also have a tendency to park things outside of the fence. It's, it, while it's a fenced in area, there's been storage outside of that area as well over time. Uh, and uh, I've also filed a fugitive dust complaint with the Ohio EPA. They've expanded the use of that driveway over time. They've expanded the driveway. Compacted gravel is still gravel. It's dusty. It's a, it's a nuisance. It gets all over everything. Um, And then the traffic, the truck traffic is already bad and it's increased coming up and down um, Mount Carmel Road. It's impassable for large trucks. In fact, my father was hit on that road some years ago by a, a tractor trailer. So he was, he was hit. hit, yeah. So there was a trailer coming down. They don't fit in their lane coming down the hill. Um, there really should be some more enforcement of that area and the tractor trailers. I mean, they just blindly follow their, their GPS. They also have a tendency to come up from the other side of Mount Carmel Road, uh, under the there's a train track with a low clearance, and they will sardine the tops of their trailers off, trying to fit underneath the railroad tracks there. Um, so th there's already a, a truck problem in that area. The only way they can go is um, west down Broadwell and hit Round Bottom to go up to 32, or to go down Round Bottom into um, into Milford there. So again, you know, I don't think the burden of proof or burden of enforcement should be on the staff, and we clearly can't trust the uh, um, appellate to enforce himself. So that's really about all I have for you guys. Any questions for the witness? I, I do have one. Let's say we said we deny the variance. You have to install an eight-foot solid fence or a dense vegetative screen, whatever the exact phrasing is, and you've got to pave the driveway. Um, is it still a nuisance in your opinion if it's otherwise compliant? It, so in other words, the dust is taken care of, the, it's less visible from Mount Carmel you know, there's a, and, and Broadwell, whatever it is, is it still a nuisance at that point? Um, let's just hypothetically say you live in a, one of the houses across the street. Is it a nuisance to you to have tractor trailers with no exhaust coming past your house at nine o'clock at night? Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard in opposition to the appellant in case 19? 
And, and ma'am, who uh, had spoke earlier, do you mind submitting the pictures um, since they were viewed by the board? Do you? Yeah, you don't have to really. Oh, <laughs> just, just the ones that were shown to the to the BZA. two other parcels where they're storing trailers um, where they're I don't know if they're allowed to do that or not but clearly visible from the, the cages images and to follow up on uh, mr. Gordon's question regarding the setback requirement um, so there is not a setback requirement for a driveway uh, to that property line Mr. Gordon? Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else would like to be heard in opposition to the appellant in case 19? We have a couple of folks left. Anyone? Okay. Hearing none, uh, Mr. Muto, uh, would you like to rebut any of that evidence? May, may I first look at the uh, photographs just to see what they depicts. Where's the one Miss, Mrs. Johnson submitted? Pe Peggy, yours was a, was a driveway. Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the owner of the property and also speaking for myself, we really appreciate the input from the residents. Uh, we, we believe that they're here tonight to express their legitimate points and their legitimate concerns about uh, coexisting on property that shares yeah, in their case, their, their homes share an area which is largely industrial. So I, I understand and I appreciate uh, their, their position and their commentary, and, and we don't take their input lightly. It, it's, I can tell you this, it's, it's important to the owner. And I, I, know, I know there's a lot of opposition to Mr. Evans. Uh, I, I understand that. I've, I've worked for him and his companies, <coughs> excuse me, for a lot of years. And I've heard uh, these comments many times over. Uh, I've known Peggy, is it Mike? Yeah, I've known Peggy and Mike for a lot of years. And we've, we've been here before, haven't we, Peggy and Mike, <laughs> over <laughs> similar issues. And uh, Peggy is a good neighbor. And Mr. Gordon, uh, I don't know him personally, but I know he has some other issues uh, with other properties. Mr. Gordon, uh, what's your name? I don't know Mr. Rutherford. I knew the previous owner of the property he owns. Uh, but if I may just comment on, on, on their comments. Uh, first of all, I'm looking at the photo submitted by Mrs. Johnson. And 
what she shows here, I, I think, is dust on the roadway, Peggy. And it, it looks like the truck that is in front of that dust is an Evans landscaping truck. It's not a fast track trailer pulling into the driveway. <coughs> I apologize. Mr. Mr. You've got a, a stack of, of those photos there. Are there four or five in a row? That you ju you just yeah, yeah I'm, I'm looking at these photographs, and each one of them shows an Evans truck. And and if you flip back through that, it's it's five, you know, quite quickly in a row, five over the course of a second or two seconds, something. Doesn't the oldest one show it pulling out of that driveway? I, I n not that I can see, honestly. Um, I, I I really this is Broadwell Road, uh, but it is not. And none of these photographs depict the driveway that the fast track trucks use to get to the enclosed area. Uh, and I, I would admit and I would acknowledge that these photographs show dust, but the dust it looks like is coming from the back of an Evans truck. And, and this is a typical Evans truck that's carrying either sand or gravel or topsoil. And unless there's a, a, a cover over the top, you're gonna see dust just like that. So uh, although I, 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 don't, I don't deny what Peggy said, I, I know she speaks from her heart and, and genuinely, um, but these photographs uh, simply do not show that there's dust being created on that driveway caused by the fa fast track trucks. <coughs> um, uh, uh, Peggy also said that uh, tw 20 trucks a week uh, is an underestimate. I, I, I mean, all I can rely on, frankly, is the testimony of the witness who runs, who runs the company. And when he testified about a maximum of 20 round trips a week, uh, I hope the board takes that as genuine testimony and not some fabrication. So it's during some weeks, as he said, it's less than 20. During some days, it might be zero. Uh, Mrs. Johnson talked about the trees. Uh, it's true that the landscape company takes those trees down, uh, whether they're large or small, depends on who the customer is. But as I said, a reasonable condition that my client would, without question, adhere to <coughs> is to replace the trees with trees of an adequate size as specified by the board to make sure that that screening continues even after trees are taken down. Uh, Uh, Mrs. Johnson said that the trailers have been stored there for three or four years. The contract between my client and Fast Track <coughs> was signed November of 2020, so it's been one year. And uh, Ms. Johnson said that she sent photographs to the EPA in August of last year, August of 2020, showing dust and dirt. Fast Track was not using that facility in August of 2020. They started in November of 2020. Uh, Ms. Johnson made a point that uh, I believe is true and she said that from her house she can hear tr tractors running and she, and she probably can because her house is on the south side of Broadwell and behind her house is the fast track warehouse where they have 250 trucks and trucks are in and out of there all day long. So I, I don't deny that she's hearing trucks running, but those are not trucks in this enclosure. The subject matter tonight is this enclosure. For another day, we can talk about uh, Ms. Johnson's point on tractors running in her backyard, but that's not the matter we're undertaking this evening. Uh, as far as the, the corn, she mentioned that once the corn stalks are taken down, uh, you can then see the trailers from Mount Carmel Road. <coughs> My apologies. I, I, I deny that that's true. Uh, first of all, Mount Carmel Road is 515 feet from the enclosure, and even when the corn stalks come down, 
you still have those nursery trees in place providing the shielding required. Um, I apologize for the wrong address. The, the, the address that I used in my submission, frankly, was an address that came off of a letter from June 1st that Mr. Ginty sent to Evans with the original complaint of the violation. I picked up that address, uh, just transferring the address from the letter. I, I went to the auditor's website to try to find the address for, the, for this property. <coughs> there is no address that I could see on the auditor's website for this property. Uh, so I, I can't, uh, and, but your, your recommendation for changing an address is well taken, and we apologize for the trucks coming into your property. Uh, Mr. Gordon made a comment, I think, I think I heard him right, he said that there have been trailers stored on this site uh, here on this aerial map for the last three years. Again, it's not true. Uh, the trailers were put in there at the earliest mid-November of last year when the contract was signed to uh, have this tenant rent that, that space. I'm sorry, Mr. Muto, when was the contract signed? November of 20. I thought you said January of 20. No, but November. Okay. If I said January, I misspoke. It was November of 2020 when the contract was signed for leasing this additional space. Was there any previous lease? Any contract previously? Yeah. No. Did no. they use it before the lease? Pardon me? Did Fast Track use it before the lease? Y you could ask Mr. Fry. I, 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 I I'll do ask not, Mr. Fry. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I do not believe that that's the case. Uh, Fast Track had a contract with uh, an affiliate company of Mount Carmel Farms <coughs> for the warehouse site. That goes back to 2014 or 2015. But that contract did not cover storage on the property we're speaking about tonight. Uh, just, I'm asking you, do you know how long Fast Track has been storing trucks on that location? I don't care about when the lease is dated. How long, if you know. I, I don't I, know. I, I, that's all, okay, that's good enough. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I'm making an assumption that when the lease was signed. Okay, I'll ask Mr. Fryman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gordon also talked about two other parcels that have trailers on them. Uh, that's probably the case, including the parcel that Fast Track rents for the warehouse. But again, that's not the subject matter for tonight's discussion for conditional use. He also mentioned another parcel, which is uh, to the west of the warehouse that is uh, leased by uh, Fast Track. And again, that's not the subject matter for tonight. Uh, trailers are tra there are trailers on that site. It's 8361 Broadwell Road owned by an affiliate company of Mark Carmel Farms that owns this parcel. Uh, as far as the CAUV designation, he, he's right. Uh, uh, Hamilton County, as I believe all of you know, will permit property to be designated as CAUV if you can demonstrate that at least part of the property is used for agriculture. Uh, and the, C, the CAUV designation for this parcel is for only 27 acres, the three acres on which those trailers uh, sit do not have CAUV designation. That was taken away from the landowner about five years ago because it was being used for industrial purposes. And uh, as far as Mr. Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon made a comment that there's a lot of truck traffic on that road. Uh, I, I agree there is. Uh, a big part of the reason is that you have Fast Track, you have Senco, you have Pavestone, you have B-Way, all heavy industrial producers of commercial products that move their products by trucks. And having this enclosure will not increase the number of trailers. The trailers that are put in this enclosure are originally designated to go to Fast Track's warehouse to drop off goods, and even if this enclosure was taken away, the truck traffic count will not fall. It simply will not fall. Uh, and again, we, we apologize if the truck traffic is too heavy, but it's the nature of this area. The Anchor area is an industrial development area designated by the township, 
for land use purposes as the area where industrial development should be encouraged. And that's what's going on. Uh, Mr. Gordon also said that he believes that there's some storage of trailers occurring outside the enclosure. I have not seen it. I've been on the property, I'd say, six or seven times in the last two weeks, and I, I don't see any evidence of any trailers anywhere but inside the, the four corners of the fence. Thank you. Any follow-up questions for Mr. Mudo? Yeah, I do. I have questions. I'm, I'm looking at Exhibit F. And then, let me find it. I'll give you and then also exhibit E. Just again, the exhibit. Exhibit F. Turn it up on the screen. Okay, exhibit F. I got it. Um, the gap between the fence. I, I, I see it. This seems to me like if you're trying to protect your property from being uh, uh, vandalized and uh, broken into, that gap is big enough. I think I could squeeze through that pretty readily. And then in Exhibit E, there was comment made about lighting. And I'm looking at those mm. poles, and I might be wrong, but I don't see any lights on the top of those poles. So my question with regard to the, uh, the overall theft problem that you're talking about extensively through the course of your document uh, doesn't seem to be addressed from what I see by these pictures, which were taken in late October. Yeah, they were taken just last month. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess my um, question has to do with Really? Have you been doing anything to try and re, uh, deal with the theft issue, if there is a theft issue? When, when I commented on the theft issue, my reference point was not this property, Mr. Halpin. Uh, I represent uh, Evans and their companies on a variety of different matters. But you gave the impression, to me at least, I don't know about the rest of the board, but I got the impression you were talking about this property sure. because that's been the context of this whole meeting. Not any of uh, Evans's other properties, just this property. I understand that, my, but my point I was making is that the fence was put in place to deter theft that has been experienced on other properties around the area, including Evans's main location. Okay. I was directly involved with that, and he tried lighting, he tried uh, surveillance cameras, he tried security people. None of it worked until he got permission from this board to put up an eight-foot high fence with barbed wire. So that was my context, and I apologize if I misled you. That was not my intent. My intent here was to say the fencing was put in place uh, in, in large part to hopefully diminish the opportunity for theft. And in and, and the case of this tenant, uh, each, each of the 90 trailers on the site is full of uh, consumable goods. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one final question from me. Sure. Uh, and I realize that you're an attorney, and it's going to be a hard question for you to answer. but. <laughs> In your opinion, uh, would you consider Mr. Evans a good neighbor? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, let, let, let me answer it in a way that may not respond to your question. Uh, and, and, if, and if I don't, accuse me of being a lawyer. <laughs> right, Ben? Um, Mr. Evans uh, owns almost 1,000 acres of property in this Anderson Township area called Anchor. And, and it's in his best interest, it's in his best interest to do two things. And you can argue that he does or doesn't do them, but to do two things. One, to be a good neighbor, because he wants, he wants to be looked upon as someone who can coexist with other industrial property owners and residential property owners. And secondly, uh, he wants this property to be uh, up, to, up, up to code regulations uh, because he knows that it's in his best interest uh, in developing his other property to have property that 
is in compliance with the laws. Now, as I say, you can argue whether or not he succeeded in being a good neighbor or being in compliance, uh, but but he has he and his companies have, have the most to lose if this area called Angkor deteriorates in a way that makes it unattractive for development. So it's in his best interest to be a good neighbor and to comply if he expects to get value. Uh, for those 1,000 acres, he has, he has spent probably $10 million in property purchases. And uh, you can think about Evans the way you want, but uh, he, he, has, he has, over the years, uh, made good decisions on business acquisitions. Again, you can argue, argue his methods, uh, but I can tell you that uh, the man has an interest in building a business that keeps people employed, and in and, 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 and large part, uh, that's on the top of his mind. Uh, he, he's the kind of guy who will send a work crew to a place like this to put down an impacted gravel area uh, during during a, a winter month when there's no snow to remove or no ice to, to treat or no business. He, so uh, that's my response. I, I didn't respond to your, your question probably, but that's my response. Well, I'm a very open-minded personality, so, but the long and the short of it is, in my opinion, is, is that uh, there could be a lot more done. Now, my question, uh, uh, final question is, uh, will you pay and will you put up a fence that will cut, uh, block off the view if that becomes the decision of this board? Well, I, but let me respond by saying uh, I think requiring paving uh, it w w would be, would be uh, trying to kill an ant with a sledgehammer, because it has not been demonstrated here tonight that dust is an issue on this pave, on this on this gravel property. If if dust was an issue, I'd be the first to say you need to do something different. But I don't think there's been any evidence presented that dust is an issue. The photographs that Mrs. Johnson submitted were not of this driveway. That's my first. I I would rather see the board impose a condition that says keep it watered, keep the dust levels down to the extent dust might exist by keeping the area watered. That's been a very effective strategy on other job sites around Hamilton County, Claremont County, et cetera. Uh, the other comment, you, uh, the other question was putting up an eight foot fence. Uh, again, I, I think what exists today in the way of dense vegetation satisfies section 316K2 on sides south east, north. The only exception is that on the west side, uh, a condition to put up foliage is, re is required, in my opinion, because there's no screening whatsoever. But to require this, this applicant to put up an put up a eight-foot fence would be, I think, inconsistent with the spirit and the intent and the letter of the zoning resolution, section 316K2. So are you talking about fencing the whole enclosure and or just a portion of them? What I'm suggesting is that the only the only area that requires screening is the west portion. It's about 300 feet long. That's the only portion that does not comply with section 316K2. The other three sides do based on existing vegetation and it would be inconsistent I think to require the applicant to spend the resources to build the redundancy. It would be a redundancy in my view. Good. Any other questions from the board? Thank you. Mr. Muto, I think maybe you picked up the photographs that belong up here. Is that right? Yeah. So he, I thought he gave them back. Oh, he did? He gave them back. Miss um, Johnson did submit one additional photograph. I want to ask about that in a second. Yeah. So we got back? Sorry. Ms. Johnson, That's the new photo that Ms. Johnson submitted. You off this photograph. Can you come explain to us what's in this photo? Thank you. In this photo, you can see um, Mr. Mudo said 
that none of the pictures I showed showed that any of these trucks were coming out of that gravel driveway. You can see where he is turning left, or I'm sorry, turning right onto Broadwell Road. So there's not just Evans gravel trucks going through a pile of dust and bringing up dust. You can see his intent of turning right onto Broadwell off of that side road. I have about 20 other additional pictures that were sent to Anderson um, back in August. And yes, this wasn't fast tracked. These weren't fast track trucks, but these are even smaller trucks than the semis that are using it today. So if you want, I can, I still have the email that I sent you and uh, the EPA on August, I think it's 17th or the 27th of 2020. I can forward you that tomorrow from my emails and that has about 20 additional pictures. I think we want to deal with, with what's in the record here, but that, mm -hmm. just to be clear, the, the rear wheels of that truck are in the driveway that we've Coming been talking about here today. Coming out of that driveway. Same driveway. Yes. I only tried to get the best pictures I off of my computer um, of showing the dust on Broadwell Road, because I you can see I'm in my driveway. If I had gone down three more driveways, I would have been looking back that, right. but that property is owned by Mr. Evans, and I'm not allowed on that property. I could take pictures from the road, but you can see there's truck traffic. Okay. A any follow-up questions for Ms. Johnston? No. Sorry, we'd like, we'd like to I'd like to look at the pictures. Did you see that? Yeah. Okay, you're done? Uh, we'll give you another chance in a minute. Okay. Before we move on, um, for the staff, um, 316K2, I, I don't, I know it's in here somewhere, but I, I can't, you can probably find the exact text of it faster than I can. Okay. Is, is the phrase dense so vegetation, is, is it Mr. thick Chair. vegetative screen? Thank you. <laughs> so, so Mr. Nye, if you could just read it. Sure, yeah, uh, right. For the record. So the, the it's the uh, penultimate sentence of 316K2, um, which says in part, any other such open storage visible from any property line of the lot or track shall, notwithstanding Article 5.29, be screened by a solid fence or wall or dense row of foliage not less than eight feet in height. Okay, so that's, I don't know where this came from. It's coming down there. Thank you. Okay, so I, I just want to know, it, dense roll of foliage, not less than eight feet high. Okay, the other question I had for staff is, we heard about other trailage, trailer storage operations that Fast Track may be using across the street. Do we know whether those are in compliance? And I will tell you why I'm asking. The reason is, I don't want to get into a situation where we're looking at this in an isolated manner and allowing it when then they're going to be back here next month on you know, another parcel that is uh, in the same non-conforming use, say, and they say, well, it's just this one parcel. And then and that month after that, it's just that one parcel, and suddenly it's a whole lot of parcels. Do we know what the status of those parcels is? Yes, so um, as part of this month's submittal, uh, the applicant did submit a uh, conditional use request, and that is case number 20-2021 BZA and the applicant did submit a conditional use request to allow a storage and distribution facility. And let me pull up the parcel numbers so that we have, have it for the record. And that is for book 500, page 83, parcels number two and three. Um, and if I may go on to Cages to show that exact parcel. Yeah. Just bear with me here for a second. So this property here, uh, located behind 8500 Broadwell Road, is the property in question for case 19-2021 BZA. 
uh, the applicant has submitted a conditional use request for a storage and distribution facility for this property uh, located behind 8485 Broadwell Road. Uh, the main fast track at building is located here on an adjacent parcel. Okay. Is there a reason that we aren't considering these applications together other than the different titled owner of the parcel? Um, so the reason for the continuance uh, for case 20-2021 BZA, um, the applicant submitted an application that was for this property uh, that's zone GG uh, so there'd be a different procedure to go through that. Um, they submitted an application that referenced this property here at 8485 Broadwell Road. Um, and once the submittal deadline passed, uh, staff realized that, the, um, that it was an application for the wrong property. Um, so we had suggested continuing that to the December 2nd BZA meeting. Okay, but if it had been the correct parcel, we'd be talking about it both of them today. They'd be different case numbers, but they'd both be up hit here today, right? If, if we had both applications submitted correctly uh, yeah. before the November deadline, we would have heard both tonight. Okay. And, and is there some reason that they shouldn't be considered part of the same case? I frankly don't know what our procedure is for consolidating cases, if that exists, but it seems to me we've got the same person, the same tenant at least, with a similar use, and I don't know what's in that application, but I'm assuming could be wrong, a similar request for conditional use and perhaps similar variances, I mean, it seems like we should consider those together. So we had put them as two different case numbers um, just because they're two different properties. Um, and again, I'm, and this may be a question for Ben as far as just consolidating a case or how that I think the board can hear it however they want to. I think obviously customarily when you have um, two different properties that are not located next to each other, um, adjacent to it, I think more often than not we might hear them separate. Um, that doesn't mean for purposes of judicial efficiency or whatever you want to do that you couldn't say continue this in progress and allow for consideration because a lot of the same facts, the same law, the same everything will apply. So if you want to, you could. Um, I'm not aware of, you know, it's typically broken down into something like, you know, a, a lot or a parcel or different ways in which they do it. I'm not aware of anything under your code that would prohibit you from either more cleanly just considering them back to back or together at the next hearing or even frankly consolidating them if you wanted to, whichever the way, whichever way the board wants to go that you could. Okay. Thank you. Um, Anybody else have any follow up questions for staff? Uh, no, not for staff. Okay, let me get uh, one more question to Mr. Fry. Uh, you have yeah, a staff I question? I have a big question. Uh, by reading what you have there as far as the consideration, it doesn't mention anything about fencing or anything like that. So it, to me, that makes it a different type of thing. I'm sorry, Mr. Helpin? Can you, uh, can you clarify what document? 2021 doesn't read to say about fencing. On the on the agenda that was prepared for this yeah. evening, okay. Yeah. And so, to me, that makes it different from 19, 20, 21. I, I think you're right. The, the, what was going to be agenda item 19 does not have a fencing <coughs> issue in it, as far as we know. But it also did have a conditional use request to allow a storage and distribution facility, which yeah. is the same conditional use. That's yeah, that's part of the tell us something. Right. Um, any other follow-up questions for staff? No. Okay, Mr. Miller, give me one more minute. Mr. Fry, over to you. Um, my questions for you were, I, I, I thought I understood how long Fast Track had been using that area, and then I heard something that confused me. So how long has Fast Track been it using it? It surprised area? me too. I thought it was longer, and I've even texted the CEO to see if he called as well. And if I had my ERP in front of me, I'd tell you how long we've been paying rent there, but I, I don't have it. So um, again, I thought it was a little bit longer too. So. I mean, we'll, spec we'll stipulate two years, I guess, but okay. um, it seems so, like it. So the lease may be a year old, but you've been using it for longer than that. Yeah, yeah. That's and, and you're not I sure think so. How long. I mean, okay. Yeah. Um, and we also heard some testimony that sometimes trailers are stored outside the fenced-in area. 
do you have any personal knowledge of whether that's true or false? It could be, but uh, it would be for a night or, you know, I don't know, but it could be, yeah. yeah. Okay. You look right there. I mean, you could certainly park something right there and then wait till you get it in the next day or something, but it's just, you know, you see, you know, the yard dog got lazy or something, like, just didn't put it in the cage, you know, and took off, you know, you could see that happening, so. Any follow-up questions from the board? I mean, not to do that, but, you know, you can't control everybody. <laughs> I understand. Uh, this picture was submitted by Thank you, Mr. Uh, the lady. It shows an Evans truck, which may or may not, I mean, I, I can't tell if he just turned around there, but he was, appears to have come out of that area. Is there any Evans activity that goes on back there that, we, that you're aware of that would require regular truck traffic there, or is that a simple turnaround? Can you speak to either one of those? I'm not, I'm, I'm not aware of any reason why an Evans truck would be back there, except for the purpose of maybe doing some repair work on the on the driveway. Uh, but there's no Evans activity on that three-acre enclosure, mm -hmm. and the other activity on that parcel is the tree nursery, um, and that would require Evans trucks to be in the tree nursery from time to time, okay. but planting trees, taking trees yeah. out. That's so having visited the site, I, I can't figure out why that truck would be back there. Yeah. Well, as, as I say, it, it could be related to uh, uh, the landscaping tree nursery activity. Okay. Now, if I may comment on this photograph again, it, it is clear that this truck, an Evans truck, is coming out of that driveway. But again, I can't determine from this photograph if the dust is being kicked up from the driveway or... If the, if the dust is a result of material falling off the back of the truck, th th this is a dump truck and it carries sand, gravel, uh, other, other materials like that, and, and it's not covered. It's supposed to be covered when, they, when they're on the roadway. It, it could be the result of dust coming off of the top of the load on the bed and not the result of dust being kicked up by the tires of the truck. Well, that was my question. I, you know, having been back there, I, I saw no reason for a truck like that to be there. I saw no activity back there that would be ongoing truck activity. That's what I was asking if maybe I was unaware of something that's going on back there. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, in fact, it, it, uh, Mr. Ginty, if you could put up an exhibit, I think, uh, either L or M. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the driveway you're looking at here in M is, is not the fast track driveway. It's a driveway that an Evans truck would use to go into the, tr we call it the tree nursery, and either pick up a tree or put a tree in place. And it could be that the truck did not want to back up, so the truck continued uh, north and turned around and came out on the fast track driveway. I'm speculating. Right. I, I, I don't know the answer to your question whether this truck was there for official business or not. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, did you have more comments? Is that it? Do you have anything else? Yeah, one more comment. Uh, as far as separ separating the cases, uh, I would echo uh, Mr. Halpin's comment that the conditional use application for the property on um, which the warehouse is located is, is a conditional use for outs outside storage, but it is, it is not a variance. We're not asking for a variance from any part of the zoning resolution, uh, but the issue, the issue is going to be the same. It's going to be whether or not there's compliance with Section 316K2 plus uh, an evaluation of whether that outside storage meets the criteria within the zoning resolution that we went through tonight, spirit and intent and so on. Uh, but they're the related, to your point, Mr. Nye, they're related in the sense that it's outside, it's outside storage in both cases, and uh, the criteria for making your evaluation will, will be the same criteria. There's not, there's, there's not a fencing component, though. Understood. And if I can take a second crack at that apple from the question yeah. you asked before, I thought about it a little bit more. So just, you can think of it this way, too. So um, in the ID standards, it says for a conditional use, you've got to get a special zoning certificate um, for any building or premises. So then, obviously it's not a building, but premises, 
to a defined term under your zoning code in the definitional section. And then premises is defined to be any track or tracks, plural, of land which comprise a quote, a single integrated development or use of such land. So you can take the position that the premises is both this property plus what's subject or the other case that'll come next door. And if you wanted to, you could hear them, I think, together. Now, obviously to the point of apparently yep. there's not fencing issue there that you have to hear. But at least you could interpret your code to say um, you got to get a special zoning certificate for the premises. And the premises is not just this portion of the right. premises, but all of it. Right. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell the board, it's, it's clear to me that we should treat them together. They're an integrated unit. I don't think we should separate them. I mean, we, an hour ago, I was hearing about 90 trailers. We're only here about 90 trailers. Well, next month, they're going to be back about, you know, 200 some trailers. And so it's really 300 some trailers. And, you know, whether it's 100 on this side of the street and 200 on that side of the street or 300 on this side of the street, I don't think that matters. I think we should consider it together. But that's a deliberation question. Let's get there in a minute. Is, is any, does the board have any more questions for Mr. Nudo? Does the board have any more? Oh, Mr. Uh, Rue has another question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, right. uh, yeah. uh, your question about about when uh, Fast Track began using the enclosure yeah. has, has, re has it really gone unanswered. Uh, I made the assumption that the lease marked the beginning. Mr. Mr. Fry testified that it could have been before. Can I get for the board a definitive answer by speaking with others who may have more direct knowledge about that? I don't want the board to be either misled or left with uncertainty about the answer to that question. I'm, I'm not sure that matters to my decision personally at this point. I, I think it's, okay. it's good to know, but I've heard enough other things that I'm not sure that's going to be a critical factor to me. Does the board, anyone on the board want him to go do that? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. okay, thank not, you. Not right now, anyway. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sure, come on back up. You're still in the room. I just have one more question for the board. I'm still trying to figure out why... Um, Evans um, asked for permission to build enclosures and get variances and conditional uses uh, when they've already been doing it for a year or two and it's only after they have complaints by neighbors or businesses that anything is ever done and asked permission for that use. So it's just my observation. It, it seems to be a history. So thank you. I've forgotten your name. Yeah, Rutherford. Rutherford, Mr. Rutherford. Yes. Um, and if we could, could we look at Exhibit E, please? And the question came up, do we think that Mr. Evans is a good neighbor? And, and I'm a businessman, and we try to keep our property really nice for the neighborhood and, and where we're at. If you look at Exhibit E, and you look at the fence that he did put up, he put minimal effort, minimal dollars, minimal everything into this out there. He didn't try to put any fence up that would try to meet code at eight foot or whatever to try to block the thing out. You can see that the gate itself, when it was there, there's a big gap that's in there. Um, is he a good neighbor? Does he try to do the right thing? Not, not in the evidence that I've seen and what I've experienced when I've been there. So that's one of the things. The other, the other portion about the dust, um, I know those pictures are Evan's trucks and whether it's Evan's little truck or a large truck carrying a bigger, uh, trailer that creates has more wheels and creates more dust. I see it every single day as it goes past my office window through the honeysuckle hedge that's right there. Every day I see it. And the, and the dust is real. It is real. It does come up. The dust comes up from the behind where all of the big area back there, where they're back there moving around trying to park these things. The dust comes up and comes over into our buildings. I can't keep my windows clean. I can't keep the cars out there clean. It is real. It's just, it's, so when I hear his argument, and I appreciate the argument because he's trying to do what Mr. Evans is, is requesting him to do and do the, you know, save him money. But the reality is, is those of us who are dealing with it have been dealing with it a long time. I bought the place in 2014. Mr. Evans started doing this. I know that this is, has to do with fast track. Mr. Evans started doing this in 2015 with art. And it's never stopped. He didn't have permission then. He didn't get permits then. He did it in the middle of night on weekends when we weren't around. And he went back and did this. He cut down 
trees on my property, a lot of trees on my property, when he did this, and, and then it was nothing could ever be done about it. So uh, is he a good neighbor? I don't think so. Thank you. Any more from the board? Okay. Um, I think we've heard all the evidence that we need to hear. Does anybody have any follow-up questions for any witness? All right. Should we close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Mr. Sion? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Mr. Nye? Aye. Aye. All right. That concludes the public hearing on case 19. The next agenda item is discussion. Normally, I throw it out to you guys. I'm happy to start this time. I'm not going to get to everything that <laughs> I think I probably should cover. Um, starting kind of at the end of where we came around. I think the fact that there is another similar case with the same tenant requesting from what I understand to be the same kind of conditional use permit means we should consider it together. We've heard the definition of the premises, even though there is uh, Mr. Rutherford's building between them, it, it's clear to me that these are the same premises. And we should not, in my opinion, grant or deny permission to use one aspect of it when the rest of it is all out there. We may hear additional evidence that is relevant to that. I think we should consider them together. I hate to bring all these people back again, though it sounds like probably most of them will be back again next month anyway. Um, I, so that's my first thought. And, and so, you know, I, I'm interested to hear what you all hear about that. That said, um, with respect to some of the facts, a just a couple of notes that I've made here. Um, one in favor of the applicant, this is the Ancor area. It is for this type of use. Um, and so I think that weighs in favor of the appellant. On the other hand, um, you know, we heard 20 trucks a week and then it was 20 trucks round trip a week. That's 40 trucks a week. Um, and there's some testimony that it may be more. Um, I don't know what the exact number is, but it seems like a lot of trucks. Um, it is also pretty clear to me that from the photographs we've seen, the dust is coming from the driveway. That's not dust spilling out of a truck. I think that's unquestionable. Um, I, with respect to some of the questions about you know where the dense wall of vegetation needs to be, um, I, first of all, the nursery is not a dense wall of vegetation. Uh, neither would a field of soybeans be a dense wall of vegetation. Corn might be for you know, four months out of the year. I'm not sure that cuts it. Um, so, and, and I certainly don't think that we could grant a conditional use permit based on someone else's dense wall of vegetation. I, I agree that may not be in the requirement, but I think it's fairly implied. And this is about what the applicant can and should do, not what the neighbors might or might not do. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to say, well, if the neighbor changes their vegetation plan, then you put something in. That doesn't seem right to me. The other thing I, I think I'd say is that weirdly, the west side <laughs> of the fenced in area, which the applicant has said they agree that they need to install either a solid fence or the dense wall of vegetation, is the one that I thought <laughs> was not that big a deal <laughs> based on the surrounding property. I mean, you only really see it from the Sencor parking lot where that particular fence looks a lot like the Sencor fence. And so coming to this, I might have said, you don't need anything there. But that's the one where the applicant thinks uh, they most need one. I thought that was a little strange. Um, so those are my big picture thoughts. Um, I, so I think we should continue this for consideration at the next meeting. It should be consolidated with the other similar applications um, and they should be they should rise or fall together I think however I could be convinced otherwise and I think there's value to us in discussing the facts while they're fresh in our mind even if we ultimately continue it those are my thoughts well my thought would be before we go too far down the rabbit hole that we decide whether we, we want to consolidate or not you know are they the same ownership group? Uh, from staff's understanding, that's correct. We the, in the same and the the same, same applicant same submitted applicant, an application. Same ownership group. 
but they're different conditions, correct? They're not the same conditions that there there was no variances. Are they or so? They? Um, from staff's understanding, they are asking for a storage and distribution facility on both the property in question before you right now and then uh, the property behind 8485 Broadwell Road. Okay. So they're asking for the same same conditional use for storing of trailers. Okay. And is the client, the end client, the, the lessee, fast track. fast track as well on both of them? From my understanding, okay. that's correct. So we're, we're on the same same players on this side on on both cases that's correct the, the title to the real estate well is that's different. A, it's a title the real estate company that holds title is is one of multiple LLC's out there but the the P so is the so each one's coming from this LLC this one and a dot one's coming from a different LLC correct Right. And they're affiliated, but when we heard, you know, 20 round trip <coughs> trailers, these are the two endpoints of the round trip. They're going from the lot we're here about today to the lot that we're here about next month and back and forth. I think we should treat those together. I'm good with that. I, I also think we should talk about the facts we've heard today, today, well, <laughs> all right. while they're fresh in our minds. I, I agree with if you. If you're up for it. No, <laughs> no, I agree with you about when he kept saying on the west side and they kept looking at the aerial it says well those people at the Sunco warehouse are, what are they looking at the, you know what's different that versus this side which I see has much more of a public vista for neighbors and whatever and that's just my personal opinion right now looking at it if I had to put greenery on one side I would put side greenery on this side versus the other side you know uh, it is in for, as, as you say, this is an industrial area, and it's for uh, storage, warehouse, transit terminals, and all those, in my mind, involve intense use of semi-trailers and active use of sem semi-trailers. So the traffic issue is the traffic issue, but none of those conditions, uh, all those conditions to me indicate a heavy truck usage, so, uh, you know. I'm, I'm struggling with it. I understand the neighbor's situation as well. You know, you've lived there all your life, you know, and you have to look at things. So there has to be somewhere in this that we could come up with consideration to keep the business viable and the neighbor's in good standing. And I'm not sure what that condition is yet in my mind, but I know with enough input we can get there. I'm thinking that it might be paving the drive with the dust down and putting up a fence that uh, I think that's what the dust is yeah. Yeah. well it's putting up a, a fence to, that uh, blocks the view. Uh, now back there that doesn't I don't know if it makes a big difference putting a fence back there that would block the view. But I think paving makes a, does make a big difference as far as, I, uh, I go back to the good neighbor piece and my feeling is, is that if you're gonna be a good neighbor, you're gonna try to minimize damage to other people. You know, that could be an argumental comment, but it, in this case, it's my feeling. And uh, my feeling is, is that you have a responsibility to the, uh, to the world and to the people around you. And you have to be willing to live with them whether you own all the land or not. If you don't want to live with them, then buy them out. That's one way to handle it. Otherwise, I think we should be a good neighbor. Long and short. I don't mind kicking the can down the road on this one. Um, so that we would consolidate them. Um, I would certainly suggest to the appellant that they address the concerns um, uh, that have been brought up tonight. Um, Mr. Ginty, can you go to Exhibit M, please? So we're saying that there's 
vegetation that is going to block the view, but if you look at that vegetation, those are deciduous trees. They will drop their leaves here shortly, and for six months of the year um, will be bare. So we won't have the opportunity um, of that kind of vegetation. As I was driving through the property today, they were taking out a number of evergreens, which do stay evergreen, but it doesn't make any sense to me that you would take out an evergreen as the sizes that they were taking out and put it back with something similar. You're gonna put back something smaller. Otherwise, you're just gonna take the one that you would replace uh, and, and take it. Um, Mr. Guinea, I, I need you to go to the um, aerial view. Right there, thank you. If you can blow that up. So, so driving along Mount Carmel, there's a significant amount of deciduous vegetation that occurs along most of that and then it dies down um, almost in line with the back property of the neighbor at 8500. So the corn can be gone, the deciduous um, uh, trees and whatnot along Mount Carmel, those leaves are gonna be gone. And we really have no idea to what extent we're going to be able to see this property. It's convenient right now because we've got trees on tree, leaves on trees, we've got old corn stalks, we've got um, deciduous vegetation that does appear to be somewhat dense along Mount Carmel, but we really don't have an idea as to the extent that when that foliage comes down that we're going to be able to see the property in question. Um, that, um, that combined with whether um, the drive gets paved, um, whether, the, whether the lot itself gets paved, um, I'll go back to my, my original comment is I'm, I, I can kick this can down the road, but I certainly believe that the appellant needs to come back with some concrete ideas on how this storage facility can be made, uh, uh, appease the concerns and make it appealable, uh, especially to the AA residential zone across the street. Um, so um, if we voted tonight, I haven't heard, haven't heard any compelling evidence that would say the appellant is willing to um, come up with alternatives in order to um, satisfy uh, our concerns. Um, and if I were to vote tonight, I would not vote in favor. So if we want to kick down, kick the can down the road and let the appellant come back with some real concrete um, alternatives and satisfactions um, that really is going to screen, mitigate dusk and whatnot, then uh, I'll be glad to entertain it. But you know what my thinking is at this point right now. I'll piggyback a little bit off of Mr. Haber's comments, uh, especially the, there was a statement made that the dust or the picture showing wasn't dust from, I'm sorry, from the, the gravel drive, but from the stalk itself. In the past, we've had the situation where we had, uh, Mr. Haber will remember, the pickleball court and the noise, and we actually had somebody go out and test the noise to see, you know, will it affect uh, certain residents. And so that's, I think that would be applicable here, that if the appellant wanted to do that to either take more pictures or take video or do something of the sort to show us that, indeed, that's, you know, maybe that's a one-off, that's, a, that's an Evans truck doing repairs or whatever, that's why the dust came versus, you know, daily trucks and it's the same for the residents over there. I mean, if they want to bring video evidence, I'm sure the, the staff can help uh, prepare that, you know, 
submit it in time so that everybody can see it and that they, they can upload it to our systems here. So that's, uh, that's something that's helpful. And then uh, kind of further going along with that, the precedent uh, we talked about in the past, how we've dealt with other cases, and if the data can back me up, uh, most frequently we've dealt with, uh, you know, we were on the board at the same time with some Evans cases where I think it was further up the property there, there were some gravel pits or some, uh, some stone mining pits, and we had some concerns from dust as well too, and that uh, we're sorry for putting more work on the staff, but that might be something if you could share with the entire board the, those rulings that we have, uh, you know, what the conditions we had placed on those, mm -hmm. that might be helpful for the, the board as well to just kind of look at, because it, it was a similar situation, it was in a, a similar location, but we dealt with dust and uh, complaints about noise and what have you about it. So in terms of uh, kicking the can down the road, I would, uh, you know, I also agree that we don't have enough information here before us and consolidating the cases too would be acceptable for me. I have one other question. Uh, do you have any issues with consolidating these two cases? No, not at all. I want to make sure you were no, acceptable to you and your client. No, I'm fine with that. And just a, qu a question on procedure though. <coughs> I, know, I know the board meets again December 2nd and the deadline for submitting uh, on the other property, the one across the street, is November 12th, right? Wh which I intend to do uh, with, with that submission uh, to respond to Mr. Haber's comments. Do you want us to submit uh, a plan of action that would be responsive to the comments you made, or will that be taken up at the hearing? I want to be sure that we come to December 2nd hearing with all the information you need to make a decision or to at least deliberate. Well, I, I think you've heard all the testimony tonight, so I think you can take that under advisement and then come back with a plan. Well, yeah, and that's my, my question. Okay, so and, and because I haven't heard anything tonight that addresses any of the concerns except maybe putting something on the West that you can come back and address some of the other concerns that I've talked about tonight, which include the East Side as well. So I, it, it's up to you, you but, but you've heard the testimony. Okay, but my question is a, is a procedural one. Do you want a submission of a plan of action by November 12th to take up at the December 2nd meeting? That would certainly help yes. the case. Yes, okay, yeah. okay. And then, you, you, I'm is sorry. That, is that reasonable for you? Can you provide that in that, in that time frame? I think that's where you're going from. That's your real question. I, I appreciate the question. It, it gives me six, six business days, <laughs> eight calendar days. Is there any way to give him additional time to respond? So as, as far as it would, I mean, we would need to, any sort of information that the applicant gives us, we would post to our website we would include it in um, any sort of mailing that we do to property owners within 200 feet. Um, so the sooner the better to get that plan of action. If it needs to be vague, it needs to be vague. Um, but if, if you can have something prepared for okay. both staff and the board and for the neighbors so that they have ample time to review uh, the plans. I mean, that's the reason for the, for the deadlines. Um, okay. So what you're saying is he should provide, I will provide additional vegetation at the east side now so and then show up at the meeting with a, a so layout of trees and bushes or whatever he else wants to do. Th that's correct. So I mean, it's kind of similar to what we had in case 17 where they took it under advisement. I okay. right? appreciate that. Yeah, and, and j j just a comment on, on the west side of the property, but my, to, my, to my way of thinking, uh, not, not to vegetate the west side of the property I'll would be a direct violation of section 316K2, which says that the open storage cannot be visible to an adjoining property owner without vegetation on the west side. I, I drove to the Senko property today, and if you're in, the, in their parking lot and look to the east toward the west side of the property, the trailers are, are obviously visible. So it, it would be a mistake, I think, not to vegetate the west side. We're not saying you don't have to. <laughs> uh, what we're saying is I looked at that myself and I'm thinking, boy, uh, 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 just in my mind, Paul Shekels, you know, I don't know that I would object if I was sitting in the Senko parking lot versus on the east side. I, I personally would have an issue. 
Well, I, I, ho holistically, I mean, we're talking about the um, uh, vegetation along the drive, that that vegetation being deciduous is going to come down. What he sees now is going to be exacerbated during the winter. So to me, you got to look at this thing holistically. What about, what, what did, I'm sorry, I can't ask you the question. <laughs> um, the honeysuckle, thank you. You know, is that, uh, 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 that's going to, that's a deciduous that's going to go away and therefore on the south side of the property